Um, all right, so uh, good morning. Thanks for, very much for staying on, the, doing the long haul and staying on beyond the meetings uh, and the call of duty here, uh, especially to our mentors. Uh, I'm Madhu Khanna and uh, it's been a pleasure to organize this along with David Zogelman and Rudy Nega. Um, the plan, uh, th this, was a, this is a workshop that's taken us two years to organize and put together uh, from the moment we thought of the idea till now. And, and unfortunately last year we had to cancel it because of COVID and uh, we're fortunate that we were able to do it now, at least in a hybrid mode. Uh, and I'm so grateful to the mentors who had signed up for this originally and uh, that agreed to, you know, were willing to be part of it um, uh, even uh, today. So thank you all for, for, for coming and, and being a part of this. Um, so as you would have seen from our um, agenda, um, we have a full day and a half. And uh, we're going to have three sessions that are uh, where we'll all be here in this room. Uh, and we're going to be having uh, three to four speakers. We're going to take about 10 minutes or so each to talk about a particular issue. Uh, and then three small group sessions that we'll have in, as breakouts in different parts of the, uh, of the uh, different rooms that I hopefully know or Mary will be able to tell us, um, where we'll look at specific research uh, papers from um, the mentees that have submitted them and then provide uh, some feedback that will hopefully be helpful. Uh, the, the basic idea for doing this workshop uh, was for uh, people who are interested in looking at or knowing more about how agricultural economic departments work and what are some of the expectations and, um, and what is the culture in ag and applied economics departments that can sometimes be different for people who are coming from different fields or other departments and, and so on. And so, uh, you know, so that's, that's essentially the idea. Uh, we've got, we'll be talking about, you know, um, uh, some general stuff about how to orient you to the department as well as research and uh, uh, tenure and publication expectations, some big ideas about the kinds of topics that are of interest in these departments and so on. Uh, this is intended to be very interactive and it works really um, if, you know, uh, the, the mentees ask a lot of questions. So don't hesitate to raise your hand and and make a point or ask a question because I'm sure you know your your fellow mentees will be really happy that you you did that and so um, you know and and it'll make this a much more enriching uh, experience for for everybody. So uh, this is a small group and it's a very safe setting and a very friendly setting. You know, believe me, uh, I know all the mentors and and they're just fantastic people to work with. So um, you know, ask ask questions and. Um, and then during our small group sessions, uh, you know, in addition to the mentors providing uh, feedback, um, it, the, the, uh, the, the, the writer of the paper would really welcome uh, feedback from peers as well. And so please, uh, uh, you know, uh, give your opinion and, and comments on the paper. Um, all right, so, uh, you know, hopefully everybody has this, that was uh, information about if you're online, uh, you know, here is all the information for how to sign in on the small, for the small group sessions. Um, if you don't have it, you know, Mary has it, or uh, you can email me and I will, you know, make sure that you're able to connect. Uh, this is a, um, uh, you know, just the breakdown of the small groups, which I'm sure everybody knows. Um, we had uh, three people who were signed up, but unfortunately for various reasons are unable to be here today. So group one is with, with David and Rudy is now much is smaller, but uh, nevertheless, you know, uh, that couldn't be helped. So in any case, we've got a good set of, um, a good group here to uh, have some interesting uh, conversations over the day and a half. All right, uh, any questions? Uh, so before we start, I'm gonna ask everybody to introduce themselves um, and for the, you know, uh, maybe just uh, uh, tell us, you know, your name, affiliation, and uh, for the mentors, just a little bit of your background, you know, what it is, uh, your current position, you know, how many years you've been in the profession, and for the mentees, uh, what, uh, you know, where you are in your career path right now. Um, and, and yeah, so. 
Uh, so let me just start with this table. If you'd like to get started, yeah. Oh, yeah, just uh, speak loud. Yeah. All right. So, Jared, I'm at the University of Illinois, uh, and I just finished my first year at this. Madhu, I, I can't hear at all. So all right. So I'm yeah. Sorry, I can. Um, we don't have a great. Oh, you may just have to come here. Yeah, I think that'll be the easiest. We'll just have everybody walk up here. All right. Hi, Jared Hutchins, University of Illinois, and I just finished my first year as assistant professor. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Margaret Jodlowski and I just finished my first year as an assistant professor at Ohio State University. So good morning, my name is Alejandro Gutierrez Lee and I just started working as an assistant professor at North Carolina State University last year. I am a labor economist. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Titus Awokushe, and I've been in the, uh, in the profession uh, since uh, 2001. Um, and for the last six years, I've been department uh, chair at Michigan State University. And prior to that, I was department chair as, at uh, University of Delaware. Uh, so you should know more about me later. Could we have the camera a little bit up so we can see people's face? Sometimes like you, when the speaker is too tall, we can't see. see the... Can you see me? Yes, thank you. Okay. I'm uh, Jill McCluskey. I've I've been in the profession since 1998 and all the whole time at the same university, Washington State University, I'm currently the director of the School of Economic Sciences, which is a combined econ and ag econ uh, department or school. And so I can, I can talk a little bit about some of the differences there. Uh, and um, I'm also part of a dual career couple and I had kids during the times, during my um, tenure at the, at the university. So I could talk about that with it if anyone wants to talk about work-life issues too, thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lee Junchen, and I go by Angelia. I'm a postdoc associate from University of Florida. Uh, my focus is uh, food marketing, consumer trust, and consumer behavior. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Aga Perry. I just graduated from University of Missouri with my PhD, but I've been in the industry for five years and in the profession since 2013. Um, I do food demand analysis specifically for meat and dairy. Thanks. I'm Elliot Dennis. I'm an assistant professor of livestock marketing and risk management, and I'll specialize in animal health. And I've been in the profession for three years. And yeah. Oh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ana Claudia Santana. I am assistant professor. It'll be my second year now. And August, so I'm just completing it at West Virginia University as Ag Finance and Agribusiness Areas. I am Lawson Connor. I'm just completing my third year at Louisiana State University. I work in the areas of crop insurance and ag finance. Uh, hello, uh, my name is David Zilberman. I'm a professor in, uh, Berkeley, at Berkeley. I've been in this uh, at Berkeley for about 45 years, a little bit too much. And uh, throughout my career, I moved uh, from water to pesticide to biotech. Now I do supply chain and I have fun set. I'm uh, Rudy Naiga. I, I just moved to Texas A&M as uh, department head. Um, previously, I was uh, at University of Arkansas. Um, 
and I, I've also been on the faculty at, at Rutgers University in New Jersey and Massey University in New Zealand. My work is mostly on uh, food and health economics and behavioral and experimental. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm Brittany Goodrich. I'm a cooperative extension specialist at UC Davis. Um, I've been there for about a year and a half now. Um, prior to that, I was at Auburn University. Um, so I'm out since, I guess, 2017. Uh, my research areas are really um, like specialty crop economics and, and risk. Hi everyone, I'm Patali. I'm postdoctoral scholar at University of Kentucky. Uh, I have been there about seven months now and uh, my research area right now is hemp economics. Good morning, I'm Luis Peña Levano, assistant professor of Wisconsin River Falls. Actually, this is my first week as assistant professor, so I'm really happy. <laughs> Uh, my area of, um, of expertise uh, is dairy economics and international trade. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Stephen Devdas. I got my PhD in 1985 from Iowa State. I think only David is longer in the profession than I am. <laughs> so, um, my area is, uh, areas are in um, trade, uh, production economics, uh, industrial organization. Um, currently, I'm uh, Emma Beth Thompson and Chair at Texas Tech. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Jin Chen. I got my PhD from the Ohio State University about two years ago. And right now I'm working as a data scientist in the industry. So why is that I'm working in industry? The company name is not important anymore. It's on the other side. Um, but um, my, my research interest back in school was focusing on development economics and agriculture economics. But after I began to look for jobs in industry, uh, right now I focus more on like machine learning methods where application of you know causal inference integrated with machine learning some new methods like that and the uh, natural language processing techniques thank you good morning everyone i'm dq field i'm currently serving as dean of the college of ag food and life sciences at the university of arkansas I've been there about three years prior to that. I was at Auburn University for about 16 years and I guess totally about 22 years in the profession. Um, glad to be here and I think looking forward to this opportunity. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Alexis Villasis. I'm a first year assistant professor at Arizona State University. Um, originally from Ecuador, but been living here for the last seven, eight years. Um, I mostly focus on international development on the side of behavioral and experimental economics, but I also do production economics and core production here in the United States. Thank you. All right, and we'll have the um, those on Zoom introduce themselves next. So. Uh, all right, uh, so let me just call on you as I see you on the screen. Uh, Lyndon, if you want to unmute and introduce yourself. Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Lin Fan. So I got my PhD from University of Illinois in 2018. I'm um, assistant professor uh, of agriculture economics at Penn State University. I'm finishing my third year now. And my area of research is on food access, obesity, food assistance program, and food economics and policy. Uh, Julie? Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Caswell. I am an emeritus professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, 
I was reminded yesterday in a session that uh, the first AAEA meeting I went to was in 1976 at Penn State. So I've been around a little while. Um, I also am a dual career. My husband's an agricultural economist and have had a lot of experience um, as department chair. We were actually in three different colleges, the old egg college, the business school, and then the social and behavioral, uh, College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. So I've been around the block a few times in administration. Thank you. Uh, Junji? You're muted. Uh, good morning. Uh, <laughs> currently, I'm a professor in the Department of uh, uh, Applied Economics at Oregon State University, but uh, we soon joining <laughs> NC State as head of, uh, of its Department of uh, Ag and Research Economics. So I wish I could join you in person, but I've been sitting uh, in this empty house waiting for my furniture. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I would, uh, but I, I, you know, my research area really focuses on egg production, land use, and environmental quality. I have been here for a while. I got my PhD in 1992, so that's a long, uh, quite a while ago. So look forward to interact in the next couple of days. Okay, um, Zen Chen Chen. Hi. Anyone hear me? Yes. So uh, I, I'm still a PhD candidate in the Agriculture and Resource Economics at University of Connecticut. Uh, I will be joining Mississippi State University uh, Ag Econ Department as a postdoc associate from this fall. So my area is basically land use, flood risk, fisheries, um, non-market evaluation. Uh, so for this workshop, virtually anything Every, I mean, anything will be helpful to me. So thanks for this opportunity. Great. Uh, Su Yun Jung. Hi, my name is Su Hyun Jung. Uh, I did my PhD at the University of Minnesota and I've been at West Virginia University as an assistant professor for two years now. I researched at the intersection between environmental conservation and economic development, uh, both in developing countries and also in the US. I'm very looking forward to the interactions with everyone. Thank you. Uh, Andrea? Hi, <clears throat> everyone. I'm Andrea Lashesky. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor of food systems and agribusiness at South Dakota State University. I'm finishing up my third year, and my uh, primary research area is in food and nutrition policy. Robin? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I am uh, currently a re rehired, retired annuitant at the National Institute for Food and Agriculture. Uh, there I'm a national program leader for economics. Um, prior to retiring, I was uh, there for about 10 years. And uh, prior to that, um, a variety of things in the department, but uh, about 25 years or so, um, as uh, most, most recently was, the, I think, Associate Research Director for the uh, Research and Rural Economics, the Resource and Rural Economics Division at uh, the Economic Research Service. Um, and I, too, got my PhD in 92. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Shelly? Hi, I'm Shelly Suttles. Um, I'm starting my second year at Indiana University's O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs, but I've been in the profession since graduating from Purdue in 2013, and my research focuses on energy and agriculture along with local and regional food systems. Okay, uh, Jayesh. Thank you, Madhu. Hi, everyone. My name is Jayas Powell. I am an assistant professor of economics at Boise State University. I'll be starting my third year this fall, and I graduated from uh, Research Economics PhD program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2019. Um, and uh, my research is at the intersection of agriculture and environment, and I look forward to learning from each one of you uh, next couple of days. Thank you again. Okay, hey, uh, Li Ching? Should I, we're just introducing ourselves. Um, Li Ching, can you hear us? 
you're muted. Yes, now. sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. I just figured out. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Li Chun Li. I'm an assistant professor in uh, California State University, Fullerton, and I started my job last year in 2020. And sorry, what else I was supposed uh, to Just, uh, yeah, where you're from and what you're doing. So, yeah. Okay, so. yeah. Okay, so I rec uh, received my PhD from University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign from uh, ACE. And basically my research focuses on environmental economics with uh, concentrations on conservation, uh, restoration, and like environmental policy. Okay, great. Um, and so our one other uh, mentor, which is Don Thilmany, uh, will be joining us just a little bit late, but you know, she is very much here and will be coming in. All right, so I think that's the group we have. And our first session has, um, for our panelists and we're going to get started with Rudy and David and, and the others. So, Rudy. So I need to share the screen. Right? All right. Oh, you need to share the screen. So and the do you have it? Um, or do, uh, it's in there, yeah. Okay. Uh, you already have it up. Uh, yeah. Do you know where to find it? It's in the desktop. Okay. Uh, maybe somewhere. This one. All right. Yeah, we're just let's share screen right. Yeah. Where is it? This one. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? And the Zoom as well. And you can see the slide, right? So I'm just gonna give an, uh, the basics, if you will, or of um, some of the expectations uh, on research, teaching, and service uh, in an agricultural and applied economics department. Um, I've, I've um, gonna focus on just the, the research and teaching appointments, obviously, because this is a research mentoring workshop. Um, Okay, so as I've mentioned, I'm gonna uh, focus on the research and teaching appointments. Uh, there are different types of research teaching appointments. There's the tenure track, obviously, and I think most of you are, are on that, uh, but there are also non-tenure track appointments. Like in my department at Texas A&M, there are instructional assistant professors, there are um, assistant professors of practice, and there are lecturers, right? So I wanna start with just the general expectations. And these are just some of my thoughts for tenure track assistant professors. One obviously is to exhibit potential for emergence as a recognized scholar um, and typically uh, to be an improving teacher, right? So you don't have to start as an excellent teacher right away, although some do, right? Uh, but there's, all, there's that expectation that you improve um, as you go, as you as you gain more experience, another one is to provide potential for attaining some regional, national recognition of one's scholarly work. I think we all know about that. There's also expectation to participate in obviously national and international scientific groups uh, related to your own work uh, through attendance in in uh, professional meetings, presentations. Um, roles in program design, policy deliberations, um, and so on. And then participation in scholarly activities, uh, not just outside of your university, but also obviously within your university and even within industry groups. Okay. And then record of participation in research, research grant proposals um, and some success, right? Some success obviously in, in obtaining external funding to support your own program. But we do count as well, you know, participation in, in research proposals, even though they're, they're, they're not successful, right? Because it still shows that you've done, you've done some work in that area. Um, there's also expectation on being uh, 
productive contributor to the undergraduate and graduate programs of the department uh, through teaching of the classes, uh, course development. Um, and we're gonna talk about this in the, in the next slides as well. Participation in outreach programs, uh, external universities, industry professional associations. I'm gonna give examples of that in a few minutes as well. And um, some limited service roles on committees in the department and college. In my view anyway, uh, if you're an assistant professor, um, you shouldn't be expected to, to put a lot of time on, on uh, committees in the departments of college, right? Um, you, you can do that after tenure, but before tenure, um, you know, you shouldn't expect assistant professors to do this. I'm gonna skip this since I don't think we have instructional assistant professors in the group. Am I wrong? Or assistant professors of practice, right? So I'm gonna to go to some indicators of effectiveness of research activity and creative work. Um, obviously publications are, are uh, one of the key uh, indicators of effectiveness. Now in some departments, uh, this would vary perhaps uh, depending on the department, right? In terms of the expectations of, on the quality of the journals, the number of journal articles uh, that need to be published. And I'm sure this is gonna be discussed throughout today and, and tomorrow. Presentations are also count, can be counted, particularly invited presentations. And there's more and more emphasis on impact, right? Uh, in many departments, I think you are required at the end of the year to, to write impact statements, for example. Uh, but this would include awards, citations, you know, and obviously evidence of state and, and regional impact. Then service uh, would be service uh, on editorial boards, professional journals, uh, professional organizations. Now, I normally would consider grants as an input <laughs> to scholarly work, but the reality of it is upper administration now consider grantsmanship as also part of an output, right? Um, so, if you're just publishing journals, but not having grants, in many departments, in agricon departments now, uh, um, you're gonna get an advice to start considering uh, developing your grantsmanship skills. Okay, it's becoming really important. Indicators of effectiveness of teaching, some of these are just expectations, uh, course de development and delivery, evidence of courses taught at a rigorous and challenging level, right? with recognized excellence. Uh, we also consider feedback from former students as in terms of their con your contribution to their learning that would have probably helped them uh, to advance professionally. Teaching scholarship, uh, at our board meeting a few days ago, we actually discussed this uh, and the fact that our relatively new journal, AETR, I can't believe it's already three, four years old, <laughs> right, Titus? Um, it's becoming a really good uh, a good outlet for teaching scholarships, right? So especially if you have a majority teaching appointment, I think you should really consider as well publishing in, in um, journals focused on economic education or teaching such as our, our AETR. Invited national presentations about teaching, advising um, are also important. Working with undergraduate honor students, um, if you have honor students in, in your in your organization or de or department, outstanding direction of, of graduate research, um, so direction of graduate students, not just as a member of the the graduate committees, but as the the lead advisor right uh, of graduate students would be important as well. And more and more uh, departments are looking at you know, uh, the importance of placement of graduate students uh, or postdoctoral fellows, because uh, that's obviously uh, uh, evidence of, of quality of, of your um, uh, teaching. Teaching awards, um, there are also teaching grants now that you can apply to uh, within your university and even elsewhere in, in foundations. And just really external recognition about your overall teaching um, uh, program. 
serve, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think service would be less of an emphasis at the assistant professor level. Nevertheless, you know, you're expected to show uh, progress in terms of your service activities. So part of it, it could be an officer of a professional organization. I think one of the things that really help uh, our association members uh, uh, is the creation of the sections, right, in AEA uh, that has provided opportunities to many of our young members uh, to participate um, on leadership, right, in those sections. So serving on editorial boards would be one. Um, chairing uh, a committee, perhaps, you know, uh, at the department and, and college level, um, and even serving on, on commissions, uh, task forces, um, not just of professional societies, but also of governments, NGOs, and, and industry. So that, that's all I have. And David, I think you're next, right? David will talk about more of the upper level strategic things. <laughs> Do you have a slide, David, or? I want them to understand my accent. Anyhow, <laughs> Anyhow so I, I start, uh, okay, hi guys. I start really good, since, since I'm basically uh, ready, uh, this, uh, this, the last stages of my career, I'd like to have several points that I really think are really important. I think a lot of times the general things that are, that look like cliches are probably more important than a lot of the practical, what is considered practical. I think that the fir uh, first thing that you need to do is to know yourself. You need to know what you are strong and what you are, what you are strong at and what you are uh, weak at. For example, when I start, I, I hate to work by myself. I love to work with teams. When I started, people told me, don't write the paper, write paper by yourself. If I would have writing paper by myself, today I will be being a true salesman. Almost all my papers are with people. So the point is this, your boss has to decide, well, does he want someone that write many papers with a team or you want someone, because, or, or you don't want it. So to some extent, Work to your strengths. Don't let other people tell you who you are because they don't know you. The other thing is that I realize that I'm really a slow writer, but I can dictate as good as anyone. This is very productive. So all the time I found a way that I work with others and I, dict I spend money on, for, on dictating because I cannot write and think at the same time. Some people can do it, I can't. So I think the first thing you have to know yourself. The number thing is you need to have a balance. Uh, because in academic career, I think the first thing that people told me, the only thing that matters is research. Write paper, write paper, everything will come. This is baloney. I know so many people that don't get tenure because they were lousy teacher, because they neglect teaching. Because teaching, a lot, see, like, a lot of teaching, to be a great teacher is tough, it's a gift. To be a good teacher is an effort, even if you start as a terrible teacher. Not only that, I think when you teach, you learn. I got so many papers, ideas while I was on the board teaching something, basic, basic stuff. So don't neglect it, don't neglect teaching. The other thing is you have to obtain resources. What do I mean? You have to get grants. The worst thing is to be in, uh, is, 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 to, is, is to think, like we have a lot of faculty members think, I write all this great theoretical work and conceptual work. I don't have time with all this nonsense of obtaining money. And they become beggars and they cannot have students. Obtain resources. Now, I myself minimize applying to NSF. Why? A lot of work, minimum likelihood of success is minimal. So if I see that a stupid commodity group want to give $25,000 for a student, it's not very prestigious. All dollars are green. So, if you are able to, with minimum effort, to get a grant from uh, California Banana Commission, even though they don't go banana in California, you get a grant from California Banana Commission, and you write a paper that more or less serves their need. Generally, when people give you money, the only thing they care at the end is there will be some paper. Now, you're not a consultant. There is a totally different thing. When you are a consultant, you have to do the job. 
when you are academic, you have to publish papers that will, that will have some insight and will be relevant to the field. So I generally, from the beginning, always try to get, uh, to get resources in a way that maximizes the, the resources and effort. For example, I would never apply to AID money. It doesn't mean that you couldn't apply. But I once spoke with AID after five minutes, I realized that I have to fill 500 forms and basically I become a slave of the US government. I decided, okay, let people in other places do it. But the key element you have to identify, there are many sources. The glamour sources are not that critical. The critical sources are the sources that you can get it. The other thing, and that's what Manu said, be part of multidisciplinary team. It's much easier to get resources as part of the team to, than to get your own resources. When I get, when I apply to a grant to NSF, it's something that I know that I will get. It's generally something that I did. And I rarely apply to a grant on something that I didn't do. I know everything and I basically, I promise what I have almost already have because I know that it will be impressive. I know the results because the people in the grant they never check it. They will only want to see that they get something out. And if you overperform, that great. So that's the second thing. The other thing is people tell you, don't get involved in department politics. You don't need to be active in department politics. You don't need to be a associate there, but you cannot avoid department politics. So first of all, you be informed. You need to know what's going on. You really need, you cannot add, you cannot say, I'm, a, I'm this great writer that uh, doesn't care about the world. You have to be informed. The second thing, you have to have a position. You don't need to express it. You need to be involved when it's needed, and sometimes you need to take a stand. I, I tell you, I, I really think that one of the things that, uh, that really kept my career a lot was that when I started, I said, gosh, I'm from Israel. I'm in Berkeley, but I really, why should I involve in departmental politics? A lot of you are international students, that's the mentality. I am from India, take me some time, I don't want that all the American men in their business. After a year, I realized it doesn't work this way. I saw one or two things, I saw that, uh, I saw that one faculty tried to make sure that another faculty, done, done, another faculty member doesn't get tenure. And he would, be, he would have been successful if I didn't interfere. And I was an assistant professor, came to the chair, and I said, something wrong is going on there. And I knew that it would be a problem because these two guys were seniors than me. But I realized sometimes you need to have a position and you don't need to operate every time, but sometimes when no one is there, you have to be there. I think that is really, really important. Because at the end, you are a citizen. Uh, you're, and the other thing is, once you're in a department, matter where you came from. You are part of the department. This is your department. I think that is really important. Uh, the other thing is, you have to be a, a good colleague. I think this is really, at least in my mind, this is really, really a, a crucial, being a, 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 being a good colleague. Number one thing is, to be, you have to be loyal. You have to be part of the department. You know, I know some people come from Econ and they feel that this is a, that that was really that it's unfortunate that they are in ag econ. Forget about it. You are an ag economist. You don't like it, leave the room. It's not embarrassing. It's quite, I think it's it's quite an honor. It's a parallel thing. That's the first thing because at the end it will it will it will be something that poisons yourself. I saw colleagues of mine that that basically apologize for their existence for many years, and after 20 years, either you accept it, or you feel that your life was a failure. So to some extent, accept where you are, and that's your reality, and, and be proud of it. I think that is very, very important. The other thing is to, to learn to have constructive criticism. To me, that's the most important thing, because your job is to criticize, but don't be mean. Be Basically, try to not make it personal, try to see the right, uh, to, to, make, to, to see the good spot, but tell the truth. That is very, very important because a lot of time you have people that really enjoy to really to talk to you. The one thing that I remember, if I look at editors of AJAE, some editor I really like, like there was a guy named Peter Berry. Even when he rejected you, he was very nice. There were other editors that, tell, that basically told you, this, the paper is uh, stupid and you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
15 years later, when I got a paper from this guy, my tendency to write it was to write to him the same thing, you know. <laughs> You know, the, the, uh, the other thing is uh, make friends and avoid enemies. It, it's very, generally, you, you don't know what will happen. The department is a collective group. You, you may need other people. So when people are in trouble, try to help. You don't be, believe how many times you have a situation that people uh, need your help. Be there for them. Listen. And generally, avoid jealousy and be supportive. It's very easy to be jealous, but we are, we are, the good thing about academia is that we are not, compete, we are not in a pyramid. Unless, you see, you see, when you start at least, don't think about administration. Eventually you become an administrator, but we just say, hey, man, I would like to be in the department, then be the chair, then I think it's a wrong career choice. Being a chair or a dean, it's not something, it's not something that I'll aspire to. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic job. But in academia, the objective is to be as good scholar as possible. And if you become a chair or a dean, that's great. So to some extent, so you don't compete with other people. You basically are supportive. And if someone publishes a paper and you, you don't, don't really, don't, don't, don't make that jealousy make life really difficult. And the other thing, the most important thing, be a mentor. Basically, the biggest privilege that you have as an academic from the first moment is to basically to guide other students and to build a team. I, I, it didn't come to me naturally, but if I think what, what was my biggest thing in my career is basically working with other people and, and mentoring them. And you don't realize the moment that you become a professor and you have the title professor, it's the, you're the same person. Then pe but people suddenly treat you like a person of authority. Like, I remember that in the beginning when the staff said, Professor Zilberman, I was looking to see who they are <laughs> speaking about. So, so I think that, that is really important. You are a person of authority and you have to take it, it, uh, advantage of it. Now, the other thing is that basically you have a lifelong learning. Um, a lot of people, I, 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 one thing that I learned is, Every time that uh, I get an advice, I'm very careful. First, I say, who gives you the advice? And the second thing, a lot of time, advice can be really bad. So people say, gosh, you need to have one field and be an expert in the field. This is the first thing people call, take your field and, and stick to it. I cannot stick to anything. You know, but on the other hand, you need to have skills and you need to be, you, like what Madhu said, T, you have to be broad and deep in something. But you need to improve your skills. Skills disappear all the time. So all the time you have to improve your skills. And you basically, you have to read journals. You don't need to read journals all the time, but you need to know what's going in the literature. And once in a while, you have to study. Now, uh, well, now the best thing about teaching graduate is that you have to read the paper so you don't embarrass yourself. And the by byproduct is to learn new techniques. That's the way I learn about that. Another thing, read, read the news. Applied economics is about the news. If I look at my career, you see, like, there are some faculty members that uh, say, God, what inspired you? And uh, the guy in Berkeley, that is, oh, I found a mistake at Stiglitz. Good! First of all, you went deep enough to find a mistake. I never find a mistake in Stiglitz. If I find a mistake in Stiglitz, it's really bad for him. But what I do, I read the newspaper. So I read in the newspaper, people invented something called GMO. Hmm. So I, I switched to GMO. You understand? Biofuel. I realize it will be a big deal. But most ag economists don't know, didn't know. When I start working on biofuel, most ag economists didn't know what biofuel is. When I start working on GMO, no one knew. So you have to read the news. There is a new agricultural program. You need, you know, some ag economists di didn't know that COVID exists because it wasn't an ADA. So I think. You <laughs> So I think that you really need to know the news. And the other thing, you have to look beyond the discipline. The discipline is evolving. But I think a key point is to be able to pivot your career. You, 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 you see that, and it's really tough because you may go one way and you think that is great. And then suddenly the world is passing you by. So pivot, 
move to another direction. Uh, have, 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 have a new technique. I, I, I have done it several times in my life. Like for example, I gambled on biofuel. Great gamble for 10 years. Now I know that I cannot continue to be the great biofuel economist forever because I will have no citation. So now I move to supply chain. So all the time you have to think about how you do it, how you, what you move. The other thing is exceed your expectation. You have to set expectation that, that you meet the requirement or the expectation. Be ambitious, but always ex try to exceed your expectation. Try to over. That's two, two points I want to make. The other thing is you have to have a, you have to have a, life, a, a career life balance. You cannot really say, God, my life is my career, unless you are, I don't know, some people like this. I know at least one person that their life is a career. But most of the people that I know that try, that are only one drunk mind, at the end, end up uh, having alcohol problem. So to some extent, what you really need to do is try from the beginning to see how my career fits with my life and how I, how I accommodate my relationship, my family, my wife, blah, 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 blah all that other stuff. Rather than, do it, rather than saying my career is a king. Because at the end, when you have disruption in life, they destroy your career. People that generally were successful in their life have generally very, very affected the automated career. And I think the other point is that academic job needs to be enjoyable. You don't you get good money, but you may be able to get more money working in the private sector. But sometimes academic job become miserable. I have some colleagues that they say, good, why, I ask myself, why is this paper in academia? If every time that you get a rejection, you have a little heart attack. And uh, every time that, uh, and, and, uh, and every time that you go to teaching class, you basically shake it back. Why do, why do it? To some extent, it's academic career is the most fun career in the world. You, if you enjoy traveling, you enjoy writing paper, you enjoy performing, and you have ideas to paper, they are great. But if it's miserable, you can uh, quit. Now, the last uh, part is about uh, Agikon. Agikon is its own entity. It has its own culture, its own journals, its own. It's related to economic, it's related to other disciplines. The people will speak about top five. Top five is important. I have some papers in top five. But that's not the end. That's not the measure. The me the, to me, the one good thing now is that we have citation. Because citation is another measure. It's not the ultimate measure. It, you need to have papers in good journal. But the key, but what you realize is that you are in a in a different department and the objective and the agenda and the important topics are different. So you really need to know what is going on within your discipline and, 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 and how to get involved. Now, the last thing that I want to do is, I am a faculty member and I have an extension position. Now, I, I, and I did it on purpose. Now, I have an extension position for two reasons. One reason is that to, because I'm working on extension, it's not to spend that much time about it. I edited journal with section called ARE Update. And once in a while, because of my, I go and I speak with farmers and stuff like this. So well, I get inspired. They know me. I know them. These are potential donors. And it's much more fun. To me, it's a lot of fun to go to travel to, even to Fresno. Not, uh, no, uh, but for sure to Monterey and to speak with farmers and to spend a day. And that's the way that I learn about a lot of stuff. It's really great with your, with students. So to some extent, there is in a lot of departments there is this field research extension. No, there is no difference. You can do really great research doing extension. The other thing that I found that extension is basically teaching adults. Academic research is teaching basically young people. There are pluses in both of them. So to me, try to work with extension and try to publish uh, to be able to to publish in some popular outreach journal. Personally, all my life I enjoy much more writing a paper for general public than to writing a paper for, for an academic audience. That's my job to write a paper for academic audience. But I thought if my mother can read my paper, I did something quite good. So I think so, so to some extent the, the basic point I want to make is 
this is a fun job, it could be a fun career. You have to take it seriously, but not too seriously. And you realize that you have the, the key element to know your reality. You are, try to do the best given your situation. And if you do it, you'll really enjoy your life. Thanks. All right, I'm going to turn to Julie um, to be our next speaker. So Julie, if you'd like to go next. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks, Rudy, and thanks, David. Um, I, I really uh, appreciate uh, your comments. Um, I'm, gonna f I'm going to frame um, what I'm going to talk about this morning around the idea of uh, short games and long games, and that you know you're playing in a short game and a long game. Um, almost all of you are somewhere between one and three years into being an assistant professor. So of course the short game is getting tenure and the long, longer game is where, where you're going to be, um, you know, as you go through the future. And I think um, you basically need to think about your short game and your long game at the same time. Um, as Rudy noted, there's so many different indicators of whether you're being successful, you know, even within research, within teaching, within extension, all, all kinds of metrics as to whether you're, you're going to um, be tenured and then what your career is gonna be like as you, you know, go through hopefully um, some decades of, of academic work and, um, and really like what you're doing and really find it satisfying. And so, what I was thinking about in terms of the short and the long game, and so I'm going to be talking more, I think, about strategic aspects of um, where you're at. You already have a job. Um, and so I think the, the, one of the main things to keep doing um, pretty often is reviewing the terms of your position. Uh, in particular, when you were hired, what were the percentages of research, teaching, and extension that you know is is part of your position description? And um, understanding uh, for sure what those mean. So let's say your position is fifty percent teaching. Well, fifty percent teaching can mean different things at different universities. Usually 50% teaching, I don't know, it might be three, three classes. Um, but maybe at your university or in your position, it's uh, four or 2.5 or, or it's two of these and one of those. And so, you know, what is the actual definition within I'm 50% teaching? What does that mean? I'm 40% research. You know, what does that mean? I'm 10% extension. Uh, what does that mean? And I know you've, you know, you've been focused, you know that, that, that these things are um, important, but it's good to keep reviewing it because as uh, someone who writes a lot of um, uh, recommendation letters or tenure evaluation letters, um, always start with what are those percentages because they set an expectation. If you're 70% teaching, um, I'm going to be looking for a much shorter research record than if you're 70% research. And so knowing that correspondence is going to really help you to, um, to understand uh, where you're at uh, and where you're going. Then, so you know what your, you know, your position is, and then evaluate what do you, how is what you're doing aligning with what your position is about? And are you actually um, using your time in proportion to, to those responsibilities? And um, if you're not, the question would be why not? Some possibilities, one possibility is you're being asked to do things that um, you say yes to and that, that really skew those percentages. Second is you're choosing to do, I, I like to teach. I'm gonna teach more, even though I have a big research appointment. So you're sort of redirecting your effort in ways that's not aligned with 
uh, with what you're supposed to be doing, or it could be a combination of those two things. You're being asked to do things or you're choosing to do things, but you need to be aligned with your position um, or you need to negotiate a change in your position. And that's certainly possible as you're going through um, the, the terms on which you were hired do not need to stay as the terms that you go through tenure with. So you have the opportunity to say, um, I've been asked to do X, I'm doing that. Um, therefore my, my position should look a little different. And I really think that positioning of yourself and negotiating for yourself is, is, is key because again, when you come to a tenure decision in this short game, that's, that's what you're gonna be judged against is what, um, what you were, um, what you were intended to do. So are there adjustments that needed to be made in negotiations that need to be made to get your work profile aligned, both with what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, what the department wants you to accomplish, and make sure that those two things aren't out of an alignment because that will get you into trouble and staying in alignment or getting a good alignment will, will serve you well. So how do you know about this? Um, you have discussions with your department head or your chair. You have, if you have a personnel committee, your mentors, other people in the department, people around the country. So to figure out where your profile is and also to be sure that you're on an equal footing with other people in the department so that you, you know, you're not, you have a, you have a, a reasonable deal and reasonable ex expectations um, for, for what you're doing. Um, and that's most important in the short, game because you go to you know you're going to tenure in five years uh six years this is when this is is super important so uh, i think that that to me is is really important um the expectations of you of course depend on the institution and they depend on what how your how your um position is uh is described but in most cases, and I, again, I say it, it depends, but in most cases, research is always going to be the key decision variable in tenure. Uh, certainly is at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, again, you know, the amount of research productivity you have will be in proportion to your uh, appointment. But if you're weak in research, it, it will, it will sink you. Um, and that is, I think, uh, I think that's the case. You need to be a good teacher. And as David said, being a bad teacher or a lousy teacher can sink you too. But, um, and you know, being bad at extension can sink you if that's uh, an important part of your responsibility. But all of those things need to come together. But if you're going to put you know, an, an extra egg in one of your baskets, uh, put those extra eggs in research, I think, to be successful. Um, I think research also best supports mobility. If you want, if you think, you know, I'm, I'm living in Amherst, Massachusetts, and I'd rather live in Seattle, Washington, um, what's gonna make you most mobile is usually um, a research record. Um, service, you should be good. Um, I think one of the things to do with service is just to make it really work as part of your overall development. So service to, you know, being at AAEA, being on committees, um, working with people across the country and internationally in service type of activities um, does two things for you. It, it gives you a good service record, but it also, um, allows you to network. And that's a really important part of the long game of what you're gonna be doing over time as you build all these relationships with people all over the world that you're gonna be working with and that they're going to know that you're a reliable person. Uh, you, get your, get your, you get your stuff done and, and you're a good person to work with. And so service, the service record can really support the quality of your research program and the quality of um, other things um, that you're doing. 
So by tenure, um, I think your goal should be to have, uh, I, as I agree with David, you're not, not gonna have one thing that you do and do it for the rest of your life in terms of research, but having two to three, and I wouldn't go past three uh, areas of research that are, you know, what you're into and what you're, what you're building your reputation on, and to be able to convincingly put everything you're doing in the context of those themes. Um, everybody does this. I have two research areas, and here's how everything fits. And sometimes it's not convincing at all because it's kind of all over the place, and they come up with some sort of way to package it that that isn't convincing. So you wanna make sure that you have that ability to really articulate the areas that you're working on and why they're important and why everything hangs together. Um, certainly in research, uh, having a disciplinary record. And what I mean by that is you're publishing in uh, highly recognized um, disciplinary journals is important. Um, and, and uh, reviewers are going to look for that and it's a really big indicator of um, how you're doing. Uh, how other publications can fill in, but that disciplinary um, publication is, is, uh, is the, the foundation. I also, um, and this is a bit of a, uh, I guess a hobby horse of mine or a, um, a point that, that I think is important is um, as, an, as a young uh, professional or as a, a professional starting out, I think you should be, uh, I guess, careful in doing inter interdisciplinary research or doing too much interdisciplinary research. Um, you're going to get a lot of uh, probably uh, people interested and in getting lots of requests to do interdisciplinary work, to be on grants, et cetera. It is good. It does build a lot of knowledge base for you. Uh, it can be very useful, but it, um, it's, it's also got some drawbacks and it, the drawbacks are around the, that, um, does it take away from disciplinary work that you're doing? And you're not going to, in the short run or the short game, um, be tenured with a lot of multiple author articles that um, are multidisciplinary or in our non-economics journals. So just keep an eye on that and make sure that you're not being pulled in too many directions um, with, with um, research proposals. So uh, ask yourself if, if it's interdisciplinary work, ask yourself how it really contributes to what you're working on and, um, and how it's building your, uh, your portfolio going forward. Is it work, is that interdisciplinary work that, that you're starting out with being a co-PI on, is it going to lead to you having opportunities to be a PI? So are you kind of in an in a area where you're just gonna be co-PI for the rest of your life or is it someone somewhere that will, that will, uh, will build to being um, a PI? Um, and turning to teaching, uh, I think teaching with, en with enthusiasm uh, courses is really important. And um, it's really important because on a day-to-day -day basis um, in your office or in your university, a lot of the satisfaction that you'll get from your job is from teaching, from knowing students and having, having the experience of having them um, learn from you. So that is, uh, is really important. I think in the short run for an assistant professor, uh, one of your key negotiating points or points of interest should be that you have a limited number of courses that you're teaching, uh, you, you, that you're not cycling through a lot of different types of classes because uh, as you all know, um, course startup is, is a big investment. And I think it's important to be teaching at both the grad and undergrad level, and especially at the graduate level, because at the graduate level is where students are going to start to get to know you, and they're going to start to want to have you 
um, supervise their research. So uh, getting, getting known by the graduate students is, is, uh, is I think very important. Um, I must say, I, I, I don't know much about extension. I've always been at a university that uh, doesn't have an extension component in our, in our department, but by observation, I think extension is probably the area that has had its metrics change the most over time. And so I think it's, uh, it's key to understand what the metrics are for, for your particular department um, for extension. And turning to service, um, the same advice um, that Rudy and uh, I think David were saying is you know, stick to smaller tasks and stick to um, doing them well. And I think that will serve you well. Sort of uh, be conservative. Don't jump into doing, some, doing things um, that are really important or you think are really important, but nobody else is stepping up to do. So you're going to do them because it's really important. Like it's really important to have the undergraduates do X, Y, or Z. It's really important to their development and it's true, but nobody in the department maybe is working on it right now or wants to work on it. And it's not something that you can take on in the short run. You can take it on in the long run, but you need to be pretty conservative about what you get involved in. Um, certainly, uh, certainly in the in the short run, so that you can work on your longer run. So, uh, basically, know what's not your job. And you know. Being very honest, um, as in all situations, um, it's not a secret that in any department you're in, there are going to be people who are shirkers. There are going to be people who don't pull their weight in terms of running the department, um, who kind of, you know, look down when, when, um, when somebody is needed to do something and, um, and who basically don't carry their weight. So in many departments, you'll see a, a small percentage or I don't know, say like 30% of the department actually carrying a lot of the administrative weight. And a lot of um, the, uh, the work, the organizational work of the department. So you aren't gonna be a shirker, you're gonna be a good person, you're gonna be a big contributor, but you have to uh, draw a line of doing so much that what your what your job turns out to be is to make up for people who shirk. So, um, you know, keep a realistic view of what you can really um, accomplish and what you what you can do given your other responsibilities. And then the long the long game is what's rewarding to you. What is it that is making the job satisfying to you? What are the research interests? Uh, for me, that was um, the research payoff was in my ability to be involved in policymaking. As I was interested in policymaking, the research is to promote uh, information to inform that policy and eventually to actually be able to work on the policy. So um, for me, that was a huge motivation for what I was doing. And, um, what you're interested in and what motivates you is what will carry you uh, throughout the multiple years um, of your career. And as David was saying, I think you have to have fun along the, along the way. Um, I really benefited throughout uh, all my time as a student in, in, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst by having close relationships with uh, a lot of people in my department and then people across the country who I worked with year in and year out. And it's important to have that sort of sense of community and building that community. It may be with people who are in your department. It may be in a different departments. It may be somebody across the country or across the world that you're working with, but feeling like you're in it with people who are like-minded is I think really important. And, um, you know, just having that feeling of, of being 
uh, part of a group uh, makes a big difference. Um, being a professor, getting tenure, um, it's a grind. It is a grind. It is very hard. And so uh, having that sense of community makes a big difference. So I wish all each and every one of you well, and um, I look forward to uh, spending the next uh, day with you. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, all right, our fourth speaker for this session is DQ Fields. It's pretty hard to follow these guys with uh, all they've said. So I, my, my goal was to kind of follow up and, and touch on some things that they wouldn't touch on, but I think they touched on most. I'll, I'll still give a, a few thoughts and ideas uh, related to expectations and, and promotion and tenure. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, David touched on it, that, that P&T is really about building a reputation. And so the your goal is to have a reputation that's where someone sees you as valuable. Um, and that, you know, really when we talk about that reputation is really what your external reputation is. How do, how do external groups, whether it's your peer groups or external groups within uh, the state or the or the nation see you and, and see the work that you're doing is valuable. So I think that's important. Um, you, when administrators look at promotion and tenure, they're looking at it with the idea of trajectory. And so the, the idea is what, what direction are is this is the faculty member headed in? Uh, is there a positive trajectory? Do you have a sustained level of productivity or an increasing level of productivity? And I think Julie mentioned uh, she talked about short and long game. Um, Although the, the, that first, uh, be, the tenure component is, is short game, at the point that it's being looked at, it, looked at from the administrative perspective, you're looking at a long-term investment. Uh, so you're looking at this as at, if you are at the point of being granted tenure, you're looking at a colleague that you are investing in for the next 20 plus years. And so you have to think of, you do have to think of the short part of how to get there, but you also need to be thinking of I want to be able to show that for the long term, I'll have a sustained level of productivity. So uh, be thinking of it from from multiple, from both short and long term. But you really have to think of what what the group is looking at when they're looking at and evaluating you. And you know, I, I, it's, it's difficult to say expectations because, as David said again, the, the idea is to exceed expectations. And so when you are talking to individuals about you know within your unit about what the expectations are when they when they think about promotion and tenure, a lot of times they're giving you what would be considered the minimum expectations. And don't shoot for the minimum. Don't shoot for trying to just accomplish what is a minimum expectation because at the end of the day, five years of reaching the minimum may not make you um, as prepared as you think to uh, be promoted. And you, and if everyone else within that unit is, is exceeding the minimum at all times. So you need to make sure that you know what's happening from that perspective. Another thing I'll say is, um, and I think um, uh, this was touched on a little bit, you really need to make sure you understand your university and expectations at every level at the university. Um, at each university, it's very different uh, in terms of who has the most weight in the promotion and tenure process. Uh, sometimes uh, you can, if it can get through the department, it's gonna be supported by the college most likely and, and also supported uh, by the university. At some levels, the college P&T committee may have the most influence and at other universities, the university committee really um, has a lot of influence on the process. So I think it's important to, to understand that as well and make sure that um, you know that uh, from, from the, the place that you are. Um, I will say that it, it's good to make sure we, we're here at a mentoring workshop and I think that it's good to make sure that expectations articulated by someone within your unit who, who you know and trust. And so I think that a lot of times we, and, and it's, uh, it's been said, but um, making sure you, you, can't, you can't exist as an island. So you have to have partners within your unit, but also external partners uh, to be successful. And, and those internal partners or internal mentors are those who can really give you a lot of feedback in terms of this is what's happened in the past. This is what re what's required to be successful. Um, one thing I'll say that this is a, a big time management uh, game in terms of being able to, to get things done. Um, when you, I'll start with, with talking about teaching. 
teaching is something that, you know, it's going to happen. And so you're going to, when, when you have a course to teach, it's very easy to, because you, you know, you have to be prepared to teach on this time. And a lot of times you can invest a lot of time in teaching and ignore those other parts that are, that require you to focus on it and require you to kind of manage your time to do it. So be careful about, you know, investing all the time and you can make a course super great and it's really, it could be overkill also. And so you have to, you want to have, you want to think of teaching innovation, but you don't want to, I know that it, it's hard to balance teaching and research in the same semester sometimes, but you have to do it. You have to think of how much time you will devote to your research, to your extension or outreach program in the middle of actually teaching also. So think about that overall time management um, and, and still, you know, manage your teaching scholarship at the same time. Um, so, and I, and I and kind of have a, a slightly different philosophy on, on interdisciplinary work. I think that, you know, it, it's good to, to look at opportunities to partner outside the discipline. And it may be my extension background that, that makes me feel that way. But I think that uh, when you have an opportunity to um, work outside of your discipline, there are opportunities to actually build your disciplinary work on topics that uh, exist outside of the discipline. So I think that you have to consider that as, as an important thing. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I encourage all faculty uh, to try to get involved with, with someone in extension or outreach. Uh, because it gives you an opportunity to to be relevant on the ground and really test that what you're doing, we're in an applied field and, and we have to embrace that we're in an applied field. And so there should be a, a group out there that, that you should be able to develop something based upon and, and work with someone outside the discipline. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit. We, we've talked some about, about service and I'll say grants first. I think that, you know, grants are, are going to be important. Um, as an administrator, we want to see that you have a program that uh, can that's fundable. That that's something sustainability at this point is based upon funding. I think a lot, and so you want a program that that demands some resources uh, in the process. That's what that's the reason that grants have become more important. The interdisciplinary work can lead to grants, but you do have to be strategic in the ones that that you're participating in because you can get pulled in a lot of different directions. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, thinking of what your true contribution can be. And also in those, I will say, I think the long term is important. So where does this lead to long term and not think of just grabbing everything for the short term just to have funding, but they will be important. They, they're important to say that I have a program that, you know, at the point that state dollars may be cut, I have a program that will be supported by extramural funding and I can find a way to do that. But partnering, I think, is the best way to, to start that grant portfolio. Also, I would say that it's important to participate on, on grant panels uh, early on. The way that you learn the game is see how the game is played and how decisions are being made with, with grants. So I encourage all faculty, I, you know, actually as, as a department head, my goal was to make sure that faculty, that NIFA, that everybody, that the grant panel of managers knew who our faculty were as soon as they started to give them opportunities. They're always looking for uh, reviewers and uh, people to be panelists. So try to get involved in that. That is good service, and which is the next part I'll talk about. So service, um, it can be a challenge um, trying to balance service because there are certain things that, that everyone will be somewhat passionate about, but um, I think you have to make sure that you communicate well with your department head. And I, I think that it's, it's the department head's um, job to make sure that you don't get overworked or that you have appropriate service. Um, it's, it's a part of what we have to do. We all have to be involved, but you know, I think there are some things that are more rewarding as, as, a, as a young professional than others and more important for you to participate in in terms of service than, than other things. So you have to think about what those are. Uh, a, a couple things that, yeah, another thing that I, will, I, will, I would recommend if you're building your research portfolio and that can be considered SURF is also is participating in regional multi-state uh, committees. There's typically one that's going to be focused in an area of your research, and you basically get a group of partners almost immediately that have work around the area that you work in. And so when you do that, you know, they're, they're assigning topics, they're thinking of who can partner on projects, and I think that that carries you a long way down the road, and it's a, it's a research opportunity, but it also can be uh, counted as something that's uh, part of your actual professional service commitment. You know, as much as you can get vo involved with, um, with journal uh, editorships and, and review, and I think that's important. Um, the other thing I'll say is listen to signals. Um, you, you need to know where the signals come from, but you need to really pay attention to signals. 
um, reviewing packets across a college, one of the things that I've seen that that you know when it when when it's not going well is the department saying I've continually given the signal that they need to change this, but they continued in this direction. And so you have to under it, when when the department head is given a signal, it's an annual evaluation that they do. When they're given the signal that you need to alter one way or the other, you have to be willing and willing to respond as quickly as possible. I've seen people get involved in reviewing for journals and they review 34 for 20, 30 journals, multiple papers every year. And the department head is saying, this is not important. The most important thing is for you to do X. And so you have to take that, take that advice. Each unit, uh, each department, um, those signals are gonna be different, but you have to listen to those signals and look at how you can um, adjust and, and make sure that you're following their recommendations because those are the guys who are gonna be actually evaluating you um, in, in, in a few years to determine whether you are successful with promotion and tenure. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is that when you, when you think of your, your dossier um, five, five, six years from now, it is about telling a story. And so you need to think about you know, who you are, what your entire program looks like uh, when you think of building a reputation what story are you actually going to be able to tell? How are you going to be able to say that this is my contribution to science? What will that look like uh, when you're developing uh, developing that overall dossier? And you should be thinking about that each year, building that that reputation, building that body of work that someone sees as valuable and in, in preparing your dossier. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, that was just great. As you know, a lot of advice and very, um, you know, covered a really a broad spectrum and and brought together, um, you know, complemented each of the points that were made really well. So uh, let we have time for questions. I think it'll be best if you know you come up here and ask your questions so that people on Zoom can hear you. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so I have a question um, regarding grants. How important is it um, for you as a junior or coming up for tenure to have been PI or is it the amount that was allocated to you that is looked at? Uh, in my advice, titles, don't matter that much. Forget about PI, PI. Get the money. At the end, that's the only thing that really matters. Believe me, I avoid that someone else be PI. You see, the only thing when it comes to academics is that if you are, if you get money and you are able to have papers, let someone have the owner of PI. When someone said I've been a PI in 500 projects, generally I don't I discount that. So what? I look at the Google Scholar. So to some extent, at the end, at the end, you, you use the money, you bring the money for two things, to help your department and most important, to help yourself. So don't fight about title. You're in trouble if people say, how many times have you been a PI? No one doesn't get promotion for not being a PI. At least for my, I, I work with hundreds of people. People say, people start fighting on TR. Rarely fight about titles. Let the titles come to you. Don't try to run after them. I would uh, sort of add a little bit to that. I, I, agree, I agree with what David's saying, but um, there, there can be, um, you know, a connection between uh, obviously being a PI and how much money you're getting. Um, if the PI, co-PI positions that you have tend to be, you know, uh, $15,000 to do X and $10,000 to do Y, um, there may be situations in which uh, being a PI is, is really the only way or the best way for you to get sufficient amount of um, grant money to, to do something bigger. So there is, um, you know, there is that connection as well. So I, I'm not disagreeing uh, with David, but I want to add a little bit of a nuance uh, from the perspective of uh, department chairs and administrators in, in the college. Uh, one thing I learned when I was an assistant professor was a good advice from uh, 
my chair at the time, he said that try to be balanced, but some things are conspicuous by their absence. So the most important thing is to really know the value and the expectations of your department and your college when it comes to promotion and tenure. Uh, there are some colleges and some departments, if you're only a co-PI, they will basically say, uh, think that you are not an independent thinker and you are not leading anything. So yes, majority uh, dollars matter, bringing a lot of dollars. But if you have six people or, or 10 people on the grant, even if, it, if it's a big grant and you're a co-PI, with many others on it, and all of your grants are like that, especially if you are marginal in some other areas, that may count against you in some institutions. So you don't want to be PI all the time because it takes a lot of work, but sometimes find places where you can be a PI. So it's not so conspicuous that you are never a PI on the grant. I, I, I want to add one more thing is what you don't want as well is be really prolific in grantsmanship and not produce output out of it. <laughs> so that's, I believe me, I've seen those happen and that can be a negative as well. Okay. So output, as, as I've said earlier, grants should be considered input to scholarly work but admi upper administration is using it now as an output but at the same time, you got to show output when you're given an input. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I would sort of second that because, uh, you know, when, as Tiki said, what matters is in your PNT work is the, the, you know, the narrative that you tell about your work and the body of work that you've done. And, and in that, if you can actually show what, how the grants that you did uh, contributed to the outputs that you got, you know, that's a really compelling story as opposed to just having the grants and the output on something else. Um, so I'm just going to raise one question, uh, you know, that we face, uh, uh, that we've sort of discussed in our department, and I'm sure it's something in others as well, um, and sort of related in part to what uh, Julie was saying, you know, the short uh, and the long game and so on. But, uh, you know, there is this sort of tension in our, in Ag Econ departments about, quality versus quantity and people coming in from, um, you know, econ or econ type departments um, where the culture is more, you know, a paper a year and high quality journals, as opposed to an ag econ where it is, you know, you have a few good papers and then you have other papers that are good, but not necessarily in uh, the top five or even necessarily AJE. Uh, you know, how do you balance that and balance that from the perspective of the department uh, and the culture in the department, as opposed to an individual's incentives, uh, which are, um, you know, which may be, of course, in the short run is to get the tenure, but then in the long run, you also want to be known for those high quality journals. And, and what advice do people, you know, to the mentors, what, what, what advice and how do you uh, deal with that? And, um, you know, what advice would you give to, the, to our um, um, early career professionals um, in that? in that sense. And, and I, sort of related to that, I guess, is just this thing that, um, you know, are you, uh, which is also a bit of a difference in culture between Agicon and Econ, where an Agicon, as was somebody said, is that, you know, your, your goal is to get tenure, look at what, what the department and the college, our expectations are and follow those to get tenure there, as opposed to, you know, uh, getting tenure in the profession. So it's, are you looking for tenure in your institution or you, should you be looking for tenure in the profession? And those may not necessarily be the same thing. So, you know, leave that to people to address. <laughs> so we, uh, some of my colleagues and I have a current paper where we took, we took all the data um, from, uh, faculty at, ten, at, uh, at PhD granting institutions in both econ and ag econ, and we're looking at, we're looking at issues of gender and, um, and, and uh, underrepresented minorities. And we found that, uh, we found that the, we're trying to predict which, uh, which position they're in, assistant, associate, or full with, and, and we found that the, uh, 
that it's basically a two to twice as many journal articles have the same are needed for impact in egg econ versus econ. So it's basically a two to one. And so so that's I think that's sort of interesting to to think about that. And in my department, we have we have different we have different types. And so we have we have people who we call 100 percent academic, but it's in a PhD granting economics department. So they're there if you're a macroeconomist in that area, you have lower expectations for numbers. But it's but higher quality. So there is that there is that trade off. And then, but then someone someone who has an extension appointment, uh, we would expect more um, applied research to come out of that person. And so so there's there's definitely definitely a trade off. And you and you should try to uh, you should try to achieve uh, given your given your position. So the expectations for your position. And I. And I always, I always advise people that they should try to really get for their expectation for their position. They should try to get tenure in the in the profession, not just at their institution. So I, so I sort of dislike when someone says, "Oh, what is what's the requirement for tenure at Washington State?" Well, you know, you shouldn't just be thinking about Washington State. You should be thinking about getting tenure anywhere. You know, so that's those are that's some advice on those topics. I know, for for about four or five years, I was really responsible for all the for the evaluation of all econ and agricon and all social science and biology. So, and generally speaking, what really matters is your standing at your at your subfield. Now there is a myth that everyone in econ published in uh, top five. Now, if you look at the top five and how many economists there are, it's mathematically impossible. So you have people in econ that never publish in top five and they are very well known. But to some extent, you really need to have to have top reputation in your field. The other thing, it's an illusion to say, man, oh, I have a choice. I decided to publish five papers in a Western Agricon journal instead of publishing in econometric. This is not the choice. Try to, you need to know what you can do and what you can't do. Try to get the best out of your resources. That, uh, so to some extent, so to some extent, it's not that you operate without constraint. There are constraints. So don't waste your time. Don't say, oh man, God, I can publish it in AR and you try to write. Uh, how many times people send me, do you think that it will go to AR? And I look at it and I say, oh man, what do I say to this person? So to some extent, no, no, these are realistic. These are things that you can find yourself. On the other hand, a lot of time, try to be opportunistic. You have a good data. Like someone told me that he published a paper with John List. So I said, how did you publish a paper with John List? So I had the good data, I brought John List, he wrote the paper, I gave the data, my name was on the paper. That's not a bad solution. So, <laughs> no, no, this, this, is, this is real life. So to some extent, a lot of time you need to find people with complementary, with com complementary skills. Uh, so, uh, because writing paper is like a, a, a art piece. Not everyone is Michelangelo. So you really need to find a coalition that, that help you. And, and you need to know about the situation. Uh, the other thing is, as I said before, try the, to be a leading person in one field. What I find, I, I, I find several people that got, didn't get tenure in econ and in, in, in agric. It's more difficult to get in econ because uh, in some schools, because some schools basically hire people expecting that only 50% will stay. The main reason that people get uh, don't get tenure is not because they didn't publish in top journal. The great reason is because they are not top in the field. So from the beginning, you have to think, could the top people in your field, my field, consider me to be a leading scholar? How do I stand within, how good is it compared to other people in this area? This is very important because at the end, what kills you is not the paper. What kills you is that one or two people write a letter of recommendation and say, this person is mediocre. A bad letter of recommendation is worse than 15 rejections. So to some extent, you have to be very good in your field. And that's really say, don't make enemies. So to, so to that number one. Now, the, the, the other thing is, like when we come to PI and not PI, of course you need to be PI once in your lifetime. But Fights on honor and titles are not worth it. You are a PI when you are the PI. When you come with the idea and you get the money, 
other people will let you be the PI. But I had so many people that were fighting. I'll be the, I was working with someone and he said, I, I want to be the PI. And he thought, he probably waited two weeks. He said, David, I want to be the PI. Okay, you're the PI, why do I care? But no, but, but I mean, the key element, once in your life, it's, if, if you have grants, you will be a PI once in your life, but have grants. So the key element, realize what is important. It's important to be very good in your field. It's important to publish papers that you write. And I think the key point that was mentioned before, to some extent, you write a story. So you have to be the author of your story. The most important thing that you write is self-evaluation. But write self-evaluation that convinces someone with high school, high school education why you are great. When I, write, when I read people that write self-evaluation that they basically prove the most difficult mathematical equation that they did in their life in the self-evaluation, it's not good. Ex explain why humanity is better because of your work. And if you explain it, then everything goes through. And if it's readable, then all the people that write a recommendation basically rephrase your work. If, if I have to think about someone's recommendation, they are in trouble. I have to take their self-evaluation and modify it if I believe it. A couple of quick comments. So um, I, I would say, you know, we talk about tenure in your profession versus the unit. I would say only when the expectations of the profession exceeds that of your unit. Because if your unit exceeds that of profession, you need to make sure that you are in tune with the unit. Um, so also know what you're hired for. Um, I think that departments a lot of times will have a portfolio of people in the unit. And so if there's a portfolio of people in the unit, it's going to determine, you know, what you should be focusing on in terms of quality and quantity. And so that that balance is it has to be there. I think that everybody should be pushing toward quality but be thinking about what your position was, the expectations of the position when you were hired. You know, I know when, when departments develop a, a hiring plan, uh, they're gonna develop a plan around who's gonna provide the, the research muscle, who's gonna be able to be the, the person cranking out the journal publications, who's gonna be the person bringing in the grants, who's gonna be the person that helps support our teaching operations. So think about what your position was hired to do. Um, and you know, the, the last part again is just the story. If your story is quality, be able to tell that story of quality. Uh, that means that you don't have to have the same number of publications as that person that is in a different role. Uh, I have actually reviewed public, reviewed dossiers where someone had eight publications that were in high quality journals and their their role was much smoother than someone with 18 because the, they, it was just quantity and it wasn't a whole, and it wasn't telling the story. They were, they were chasing publications in low quality journals and uh, getting them done, but not necessarily a story behind uh, what they were doing. So make sure you know how to tell your story and, and, and know what you're hired for. Uh, we have a few more minutes, so we'd love to have some more questions and comments. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I would like maybe some conversation about assessing impact. Uh, that's a big conversation that's come up, you know, and and my PNT about you know do work and going retrospectively and assessing impact and I know that could probably be for teaching research or extension. I tell you the number one thing about impact is the old fashioned thing have some people that will write something good about you. The point is this, people above, the thing is this, people above you generally are older. And if you have a compelling student, uh, if you have a compelling story, that's great. I think that still, that's a thing that works very well. I remember that uh, I did one or two things that some big farmer remember and he told it to the chancellor. That's the only thing that Chancellor remember, and he knows my name because of it. You know what I mean? So make sure that, that if some if if you did something significant, make sure that you report it. If you got a letter of a letter from famous person saying, Oh, this is a great paper, keep it. Then you start to look at the statistics. In my view, if you're an extension or if make sure that 
every, that, that you basically have a surveys of uh, opinion and, and, and collect it. I think today quanti a quantitative data is very important. It's very, very important to get feedback. Student evaluation are very important. Student evaluation are very important and I think they should be important. Now, you try to avoid being, having really bad evaluation. Like generally in Berkeley, it's uh, from five to seven. A normal person could uh, be at least four and a half and above. If you have three or two, you're in trouble. To me, having real bad evaluation and teaching student evaluation is really, really bad. In extension, you need to have some evaluation. The other thing, you need to be able to interpret, to be able to interpret the evaluation. For example, you teach a class. I know, I know that's the story of my life. I, I taught graduate cl uh, class. I would let, if I have a class of like 15 people, maybe six or seven will write seven about maybe six will write three and two will write one. Okay, now a lot of times, what happened to these people who wrote two, uh, wrote one? I, in the beginning, I, I said, okay, that's what I expect. I teach a little bit above level, I really, the graduate level, I really want to teach people that be leading in their field. Some people didn't get it and they were unhappy or they didn't, uh, but the key element, don't let some bad evaluation affect you, but try to, to explain that. So it really it needs to be a mixed portfolio. Personal recommendation and good work is still the number one thing. Anyone that's someone that, if you have people that want to praise it, make sure that, that this praise is reaching someone. Try to get as much a, a quantitative evaluation. But what I said before, the number one thing at the end in your career is the letters of recommendation from outside reviewer. There is nothing that in my view can kill someone or can help someone with letter of recommendation. If someone in a better university or equivalent university said, God, this person will get tenure in my university or I'm, I'm surprised that this person didn't get tenure, that can help you a lot. If when it, at the tenure letter at the end it said, you write, someone write a letter, oh, this person is a wonderful person, but at the end they don't write, I recommend tenure, it's like a negative letter. So these are the things that really matter. I wanted to add just a little bit on, on the teaching front, and um, it was already commented uh, in the session um, that if you're not a great teacher to begin with, um, it's, it's really about that you're getting better. And however, five or six years, um, you're either going to get there or you're not going to get there. So if you're still, you know, um, in, in your fourth or fifth year, and it's all about promise of you becoming a good teacher, um, that's going to start to get, uh, pretty iffy because, um, you know, five years is enough time to, to master or at least to get significantly better if you don't start out being a great teacher. So um, I think making sure that your trajectory on teaching looks good and that you don't um, you know, all of a sudden have this great teaching year at like say year three, you really you know put the effort into it, and you know, you got some good evaluations. But then the next year or two, it falls off dramatically. Then that's going to send the message that you know after your tenure, you're not going to be putting in the effort to to be a good teacher. So you really have to be convincing that you're you're in teaching for the long haul, and you're and you're into doing a good job with it. Okay, uh, so we're going to, um, you know, uh, uh, conclude this session and, and take a break. But before we do that, and Don, I'm just gonna introduce, okay. have, so. <laughs> All right, um, so we have a couple of people who have joined us uh, since our introductions. And so I'm just gonna have them introduce themselves. Uh, let's just start with the people who are on Zoom. Um, so if you can just unmute yourself and we had people to tell us their name, where they are right now and what stage of their career they are at. Uh, so I can see Mani, if you'd like to start. Sure. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Mani Ruhirat. I'm an assistant professor in the Ag Sciences Department at Clemson University. I started February of 2020, but then my tenure clock starts at the beginning of the 20, 2021. I'm in my second year, basically, of tenure clock. And my appointment is 75% research and 25% extension. Okay, thanks. Um... And then Katie, I think you've joined now. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Harris Lagudakis. I'm an assistant professor at Iowa State University and I'm starting my third year here this coming fall. Okay, um, Nicholas. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nicholas Gary. I'm a uh, postdoctoral research fellow at the Smithsonian Institution, uh, jointly with Cornell. And I'm in the second year of the postdoc. Okay, uh, Grace. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Grace Melo, and this is my second week, or first week, uh, starting at Texas A&M as a visiting assistant professor. Great. Um, am I missing anyone who's on Zoom and has not had a chance to introduce themselves? Okay, um, and then uh, one of our mentors, John Tilmany, has joined us. So I'll ask John to uh, just maybe come here and because we've got people in Zoom. So, good morning, all. I'm Don Tilmany from Colorado State University, and I'll be mentoring with Titus today. Um, and I think I'm here primarily to talk about extension and funding, but happy to answer questions about anything. Thank you. Oh, this, I figured out last night, this is my 30th year. Um, and I only have missed one meeting in 30 years. So I've been to too many AAs, uh, but, but all, all, well, the joke is it's my, it's always over my birthday. My birthday was yesterday. So my husband's like, do we ever get to celebrate a birthday? Not an AEA. Anyway, thank you. All right, and uh, we actually have a volunteer mentor here as well. Uh, so I'm gonna have Kathleen Liang introduce herself. Kathleen is, uh, has been uh, very active in the mentoring committee, is the chair of the mentoring committee. And uh, yesterday received our uh, A President's Service Award for mentoring. So thanks for joining us, Kathleen. It's nice to see everybody. I'm here to support Madhu and all the mentors and the mentees. We appreciate this opportunity. You guys take time to be here and uh, share your wisdom and experience to support the younger generation or emerging scholars. I'm just here to support everybody. It's just a fantastic to see everybody here. Thank you. Started. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone for coming back and uh, you know, continue to finish off your coffee and everything, but we'll get started with the second session. Uh, and I'm gonna just pull up my list to see who our speakers are. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with Jill as our first uh, panelist for panel two. Okay, am I sharing am I sharing the screen, Madhu? Uh, yes, you should you should pull up the share screen and then Okay. Uh, so is it already it's already here? Where's it's, it's, okay. yeah. your screen? screen? Is it already no. okay. okay. So is it this? Okay. okay. Well, I'm really uh, happy to be here, and uh, this morning was a great interaction, and I really enjoyed uh, learning about everyone's research. Uh, so I'm talking about research and transition to tenure. I actually was not very prepared for this, <laughs> but, but I had I had an old. This is actually an old slide. I've talked about some of these issues before. 
uh, so just uh, thinking about uh, thinking about productivity. I, I want to talk about productivity and um, let me see if I can. Move I can make this. You see it better. Oh well. Okay. So think just thinking about productivity in terms of I won't I won't go over the teaching part. I'll skip that. But um, for research, it's it's really important to be organized. <laughs> I mean that that sounds funny, but to be organized. And so, for example, I would keep lists of my papers and projects with notes on what needs to be completed to get to the next stage. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, to connect with co-authors. So I really liked what David Silverman was saying this morning about that. Uh, that he he co-authors a lot and uh, it just it just helps and makes things makes things fun. So especially and it's a way to way to be uh, to just be more productive. Uh, I would also plan to submit papers to conferences every year, and and also encourage your students to do that. And so I feel like the conference deadlines can make you make progress. So for example, uh, I submitted a I submitted an organized symposium. Based on um, based on a cooperative agreement grant I had, and one of my big goals, it, and that was to make me make progress on the grant. <laughs> so, so I knew I had to present something, and so so it just it, sometimes it's good to have external external deadlines. Um, and then I also think it's really it's it it can be a, a great way to get a you know double bang for your buck if you submit grant proposals as part of your pa paper writing process. So uh, if you write a paper, they can often, it can be really synergistic with applying for a grant. So, so in the grants are more likely to be funded if, if you've finished a lot already, you know? So if you, can, if you can write a paper, you can, that can be, that can go into your proposal. Uh, and I think, and I, I won't talk about service a lot, but I think, say yes to opportunities because it can be, service can also be synergistic with your research. So you meet people in, in, in service, especially with the, um, for example, with the AEA, if you're doing service, you meet people that could be, and you'll talk about your research interests in your projects. And so that's a way to, um, a way to make more progress in your research. Uh, so in, we've talked, we talked a lot this morning about the, P and T um, promotion and tenure expectations. They really depend on your institution, your position, and your job exp um, expectations. And so, uh, I would I would ask though for um, ask someone who's at the department level or college level um, tenure and promotion committee to write up a mock evaluation of your CV with your strengths and weaknesses. So if you can, I don't, I think most people, if you say, what, you know, what do I need to do to get tenure? No one will give you a straight answer because there it's really for legal reasons. They don't want to, um, they don't want to have, well, this person told me this and then I was still denied tenure, you know? So, um, so they're not going to be specific, but you could, but definitely have someone who's in a, who's in a position to know, write, just write your strengths and, and weaknesses. Um, so from my, my perspective, research uh, really depends on both the qu quantity and the quality of the journal articles and um, citations and impact are really important. Uh, and for promotion to full professor, citations, really international recognition, recognition as a scholar. Uh, and so, what? How? How should you go about building up your building up your publications? Uh, an important thing: How would you publish? Uh, an important thing is to ask your colleagues for input. So, just like we were doing today, you know, we did a little presentation to each other. But you can ask ask a friend um, to read and comment, and one of your colleagues. Um, you volunteer to give a seminar. It's so good to get feedback. And then it's also important to um, to actually submit to a journal. You know, I think some people hold on for so long, you know, if you're trying to be, a, they hold on for so long that they, that they, um, it's almost like their data gets old, you know, and so, uh, so submit to a journal. Um, if you get a revise and resubmit, 
then your job is to make their reviewers and the editor happy. <laughs> you know, this is, it's funny. Um, I was, I was, um, I was mentoring a a colleague who had a revise and resubmit at a at a at a good journal, and then he tried to argue that he was right, and then the paper got rejected. And I was just thinking, why did you do that? That was not the point, you know. <laughs> and and sometimes, I mean, sometimes you might actually think that responding, and I'm sure you know, David, you've seen this. Sometimes responding to reviewers, you might think that it made my paper worse. Well, it's published. <laughs> So, so you want to um, you want to make the your job is to make the reviewers and the editor happy. Um, if you are rejected, go through the comments, look for the ones that you think will make the paper better, and implement them, or at least or at least discuss them, because you might get the same um, you might get the same reviewer again. And if that reviewer had reviewed your paper before and and says like says oh this this um, this author I've seen this paper before. I suggested all these changes and the author didn't do anything that that person's going to be mad and at least you can talk about well here's an issue that that we've thought about but um this is why we're doing this instead uh so then um so go through the comments look at the ones that are will make it better uh, and you don't have to you don't have to you're not resubmitting back to that journal because it's rejected so you don't have to do everything but you can at least you can at least uh acknowledge some of the the ones that make sense. And um, so then evaluate evaluate where to submit next. So either the same level or lower. And sometimes you might even submit higher if it were a better fit and you got good feedback and you could improve it. So think about where to submit. And then <clears throat> I always like to um, keep multiple projects going. And I feel like this just keeps things interesting. If you if you get stuck on one thing, you can start work, you can work on another thing. So roadblock can um, can go into another project. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's also really important to build and strengthen networks. And we were just at our table at lunch, we were just talking about uh, about the uh, tenure letter process. And, uh, and some, some universities have have um, certain certain other universities that they can call upon for letter writers. At my university, we can ask anyone. You know, it's supposed to be a peer or better. But but if it's if it's a star person, you can also ask them, even if they aren't at a peer institution or better. But when people are going to write letters about you, uh, it's it's important for you to be known. You know that it, you don't want it to be. You know, I've never heard of this person, and they're asking me to write a tenure letter for for her. So. So it's great to um, join professional associations and AEA sections. I think sections are such a great opportunity because there are people in your same area and it's easy for junior people to have leadership in those sections. And that's that's something that is that's good. Um, volunteer, uh, go to conferences, talk to people, you know, introduce yourself. Uh, it's people, you know, if there's someone that you're interested in meeting, um, you can just say, oh, and I really like this paper that, you know, I enjoyed reading that paper. People love to hear that, you know, so, and it's funny, I, someone said that to me and I, and I said, oh, someone read my paper, you know, <laughs> so, uh, and I, it's, um, so attend talks, ask questions, and then, and then this might seem weird, but go out for drinks. If you don't, if you don't drink alcohol, you can drink water, but that's a time when people are relaxed and you can talk. Uh, introduce yourself, bring business cards, you know, so it's easy for people to remember who you are. Uh, so then um, I also think it's important to, uh, to, to achieve self-care so that there is this um, work-life uh, balance uh, because I think sometimes some people work so much that there's a negative marginal productivity and uh, and so if you worked a little bit less, you might be more creative and, and be able to figure things out better. So, um, so in, for self-care, be organized. Uh, I think it's good to set regular hours, you know, be consistent, uh, limit, you know, limit your time at work, but there's always exceptions. You know, if you might have a deadline, you have to pull an all night or something, you know, sometime, but, um, but mostly try to have regular hours. I think it's good to socialize and connect and make time for your health. So, um, you know, eat, sleep, and I mean, exercise, eat, and eat healthy foods and sleep. And then, you know, take care of your family and your, your loved ones. Uh, and then also for one thing that 
um, that I think is important for um, for anyone who's a parent um, get good childcare. So that was something that when um, when I was when I was a grad student, I had my first child, and when I and I my second child after my first year, uh, the it's really important to find childcare so that you can concentrate on on your work. And so that's that's all I had. Madhu, how do I stop sharing screen on this meeting controls? All right, well, let's give Jill okay. a hand. All right, um, Junji, would you like to go next? Yes, I, I could. Sorry. So I don't have the slides, so I'm just going to uh, spend some time to give some uh, talk a few points. So, and uh, thank you, Madhu, again, for, uh, and uh, also to David and uh, Rudy for putting this uh, workshop together. So you are doing a great service to, to our profession. Okay. And as the title, you know, this session suggests, that, you know, we are supposed to address two questions. One, you know, how to develop an effective research program and two what are the effective strategies for making a successful transition in technical so uh, in my view those two questions are closely related but but different clearly the second question is much more broader because it involves also teaching and uh, service uh, interacting with colleagues and uh, so it's much more broader, and and Gil gave a very uh, great overview of what it would take you know, to to be productive to get tenure. So I'm going to focus on uh, the, the first question, basically, how to uh, how to basically uh, 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 stay productive. You know, how to be a, a kind of successful uh, a researcher. And uh, when listening to the discussion, I think you should keep two things in mind. You know, first. And different people may give you different uh, answer or uh, emphasize the different things. And two, a good strategy for one person may not necessarily work for other. Okay? As David mentioned in the morning that, and you should really assess your strengths and your weakness and develop a strategy that, you know, basically work, works best for yourself. Okay? Having said that, I, I do believe there's some, you know, uh, general, gathering or practice that uh, a, a good scholar tend to follow. So I briefly going to mention three of such uh, practice. Okay? Those practice may sound obvious, so, um, but you know, many of us often you know, feel to follow. So it may be worth repeating, even though you already know those uh, practice. Okay? The first practice I'd like to mention is to work on topic that genuinely interests you, okay? And this is, you know, I often told my PhD student, there's nothing more important than spending time to think about, you know, what topic that you're really passionate about, okay? You should really spend time to think about before you begin working on a topic, okay? If you choose a, you know, uh, a research topic that you really don't care about, I think your life would be miserable in a sense, because think about it, you're going to spend quite a few, from the time you pick, uh, pick a topic to the time you finish your uh, research, to the time you finish your first, get your first publication, often takes several years, right? If you, you know, choose a topic that you, that re you're, you really don't care about, then you, you can, I don't think you can have a happy academic life. Okay? So you should really think about, you know, uh, you know, what topic you're really passionate about before you kind of settle down on, on research topic. You know, that's kind of sounds obvious, but then sometimes we, we tend to rush a little bit when we try to, try to choose a topic because we try to get things published, get things going. And, and uh, so I think I really urge you to think about carefully, you know, think about a topic that, that you're really passionate about, you care about. If you don't care about the topic, you're not passionate about it, you, you probably won't be able to do a good job. Right. Anyways, so so that's one practice I would like to emphasize. Kind of try to work on things that genuinely interest me. Okay. 
The second practice I would like to mention, uh, which also seems obvious, but many of us also tend to kind of fail to follow is to work on things that really matter. Okay. And uh, you might have heard the so-called Summer's Law, okay, which basically says that it takes just as much time to write an unimportant paper as an important one. Okay. So that's the summer's law, you know, keep, so given that, then the question is why not working on an important topic? I think the challenge is, the real challenge is not to find an important topic, a lot of important topic. I think the real challenge is to find a topic that you have something new and important to say about it. Okay. Here, I just want to emphasize you know, both new and important. So basically, you know, how do I know the things I'm working on is new? I think, you, I think you, the most efficient way to find that out to talk to some colleagues, talk to some you know, uh, people who has worked in the area for a while, for a long time, who knows the area really, really well. Okay. And you could also you know, read some real article who find that out, you know, see if people have worked on this topic uh, before. Or, you know, you could do a very quick Google search by typing in some keywords. I often do all those three things before I start working on a topic. You just, just make sure the things I am working on uh, is new. People have not really worked on that research question before. Okay. Now let's suppose you have found a research topic that, 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 that is new, people have not really worked on before. The next question you should ask yourself, you know, is this important? How do I know that is important? Well, and that's really, it's really, really hard question. You know, uh, it's really depends on the type of paper you're writing, okay? If you're writing a theoretic paper, you know, if you could offer some new insight or new model, new tool that will radically changing people's understanding of the problem, that's a clear indication of importance, right? But in many cases, that's maybe a too high bar for, for us to pass. Okay. This is a very, very high bar, high bar. but if, that, if you couldn't pass that bar, at least you should offer some, you know, uh, some new insight that will help us better understand the problem, okay. such as, you know, the scope of the problem or the nature of the problem or possible way to address the problem. Okay. So that's, you know, if you're writing a theoretical, if you're writing an empirical paper, then adding a new variable to, to an existing regression model show that it's statistically significant or have a very smart, uh, you know, identification strategy. In my mind, that doesn't make the cut, okay? Uh, however, if you could show that the things you are working on could say help decision maker make a better decision, which could lead to substantial uh, societal benefits such as economic benefits or environmental benefits, that's a clear indication of importance. But again, that's a very, very hard, a high bar uh, for many of us to, to pass, okay? But at least your work should help us better, better understand the scope and impact of the problem you're looking at, okay? And that, you know, you're trying to assess. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's a challenging part to find a research topic, you have something new and important thing to say about it, okay? Make sure, you know, emphasize, you know, both new and important. Once you, uh, you know, of course, that's some, in some extent is subjective, but, but you, at least you need to convince your reader, uh, uh, convince the reviewer that the things that you're working on are indeed new and important. When I, you know, undertake a research project, I often ask myself, you know, why should people care? You know, why should people pay attention to, to my research? Okay. As an applied economist, I often give, give priority to research questions, you know, reached by producer or policy maker themselves. Okay. To me, that's a clear indication that the problems are relevant, right? I'll just give you an example. You know, when I first started my career at Oregon State, I attended uh, a meeting organized by local farm service agency. Okay, the main topic 
uh, this class in the, in the meeting is how to encourage landowner, farmer to adopt uh, conservation pra practice to protect uh, some endangered salmon species in the, in the first Northwest. In the meeting, some farmer repeatedly said that, that, you know, even if I do my best, if my neighbor doesn't do anything, my impact, my, my, my work, we have very little impact. So that got me thinking, you know, is, is, there, is, is there a threshold in conserva conservation effort? If there is a threshold, if a conservation program does not take that into account, what would be the consequence? And to, to address this question, basically, I wrote a research proposal and uh, with, uh, you know, with some colleagues at OSU, we submitted it to NEPA, uh, to my surprise, and it got funded. So it get, it, that gave me a chance to work with, you know, with uh, some biologists and hydrologists to, to work on this issue. In the project, we were able to demonstrate both conceptually and uh, empirically that uh, indeed, there is a, you know, in many cases, it's a threshold if, if a conservation program does not take, uh, take those thresholds into cons consideration, it could leave substantial benefit loss. And consequently, you know, uh, conversely, if, if, if a conservation program does take those thresholds into consideration, it, would dramatic, it could dramatically improve its, its economic efficiency. The reason I'm kind of mentioning this project here is that, you know, not only this, you know, this project led some high quality publication, but also leads to improvement in public policy. It, it, okay. In part due to this project and Oregon's conservation reserve enhancement program included a kind of cumulative impact bonus, okay. and which basically encouraged landowners to work together so that the effort can reach to a certain threshold. Okay. And the US Secretary of Agriculture, you know, called the bonus idea innovative. So, you know, and the reason I'm mentioning that not because you know this, this is the only way to to choose the topic that's important and relevant. At least it's one way uh, to me, you know, to find a topic that's relevant. So talk to the producer, talk to, uh, to the to the to the policymaker, and see what questions are raising. You know, <laughs> that gave you a clear indication of relevance. Okay, so it's just kind of one way to go. I see, maybe the shortcut to find a, a relevant uh, research topic. I think this morning. David also emphasized that. Go to talk, you know, go to the field, go to the, you know, talk to farmer, talk to producer, and, and ask them what, you know, things that cares about. Okay, that's the second practice, basically, uh, you know, try to work on things that matters. And finally, I would like, you know, I would like to brief, briefly mention another practice that I see many good scholars follow. That is, try to exercise good craftsmanship when writing a paper. And to me, uh, craftsmanship is perhaps the most important, one of the most, if not the most important practice, is, is one of the most important uh, practice uh, to publication, okay? And no matter how important the topic you're working on, uh, uh, you know, if, if you read a bad paper, if no one cares about reading it, then your paper won't have much impact, right? I served as an AGA editor you know, for many, uh, for several years, this gave me a chance basically to observe many kind of a leading scholar. I think one common characteristic I see observed among all those scholars is that in addition to working on big issue, working on issues that matters, that all exercise good craftsmanship in writing and analysis, okay? So craftsmanship is really, really important. You don't want to write a lousy paper that you know, people find it really, really hard for you to read. Okay? So you want to write a good paper, a paper you know, that people uh, enjoy reading. Okay? And no paper is perfect, but you know, a good scholar always try to write one. I think I'm going to stop here and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Gigi. All right, uh, so uh, Titus, would you like to go next? And then we have uh, Stephen. Okay, when you are the last one, uh, one of the last ones to go, 
you have a dilemma. You can repeat what everybody has already said, or you could take advantage of that and say something different. Uh, I'm going to try to navigate in the middle of, of those two things. So I thought uh, I should wear my uh, department head uh, hat, even though I, I ended that stint uh, about three weeks ago, but I'm still thinking like that. Um, so I wanted to focus on what I would describe as uh, strategic issues and choices that you should consider uh, as a junior faculty in the context of the department and the profession. Uh, or you could describe it as how to navigate the promotion and tenure process. So we've already talked about some of the key things, but the category that I kind of put this in are as follows. Uh, mental health. Mental health, we don't always talk about that, but it's huge because that is what holds everything together. If you have issues up here or down here, uh, you have a major problem being able to, to uh, be innovative and to be creative and to produce well. So mental health really matters. The second part is actually doing the work. And I won't spend as much time on, on this part because we've been hearing a lot about this uh, so far. Uh, then totally, I will say a little bit about social games that we play in departments um, in terms of navigating the social networks in the department and the university. And, and then lastly, I'll talk about some self-improvement uh, and uh, career growth uh, uh, development activities that you should be thinking about along the way. So let me begin with, with mental health, especially in the last uh, year and a half, we all have uh, even deeper appreciation for the importance of mental health. Uh, basically what this underscores for me is the need for balance. Uh, and when I say balance, I mean th the job is not uh, the entirety of who you are. Our job is just a small part, a well, large part uh, of who we are and what we do, but our jobs should not define us. It should be partially what describes us. So you need to have a balance or find a way to, to find a balance between your family life, your social life and your professional life. This is very crucial. This means that you think about your work in the context of who you are before you got that training, the people around you and your values, who are you and what do you wanna really make a contribution to and into. I strongly believe that the best way to really approach our work uh, is to find a way to integrate them in a way that is seamless as much as possible. And that's all I'll say about that. Uh, right now we can take questions about this later on. So what about doing the work? For us as a profession, we always think about our work in four categories. We think about research, we think about teaching, think about extension, and we also think about service. There's a lot that has already been said uh, about those and I won't spend too much time on those, but I will highlight a couple of things that I really want to uh, re-emphasize. Uh, of course, res uh, research is very important, but there's been a lot of great nuggets that has been shared on those. Uh, when it comes to teaching, one thing I will add is that uh, when you look at our profession, almost none of us took a course in how to teach. We took courses in how to do research, how to develop conceptual models and build econometric models and things like that. But for what we spend a significant portion of our time on, we, we got no training in it. That means that to be a good teacher, you need to allocate time to do some self-improvement. Many universities have opportunities for attending workshops and seminars on how to improve your teaching, how to put together a, a, a teaching portfolio. I will highly recommend that you invest some time in that early. You don't need to be the best teacher, but you need to be an effective teacher. And many institutions are really paying more attention to that uh, these days. Uh, with regards to extension, 
this is an area where th there is usually very little mentoring, just like with teaching. You get an extension position because that, that's what you're able to find or you're interested in doing it, but you didn't learn much about it as an undergraduate or as a graduate student. So you really need mentors in this area. But a few things that I've learned that I usually share with our junior faculty are as follows. Be visible. Uh, you can't just be in your office doing your work if you have an extension appointment. And this also applies to those of us who don't have specific extension appointment too. Be visible, let people know who you are. And secondly, learn what is important to stakeholders in your state and region. Because how can you meet their needs if you don't know what they are concerned about? So it's very important to know what the issues are. That means that you accept invitations to conferences or meetings by various trade associations uh, in your state. Uh, if the Farm Bureau invites you to an event, you don't have to attend all the events, but you need to go to some of them because that's how you get to meet the people. That's how you get to hear what they are talking about so that you can uh, provide some value uh, using your skill set. Uh, three, on the extension, given where we are now, we cannot do extension the conventional way, the way it was done 40, 30 years ago. Technology is a big deal. Uh, it's important to learn how to integrate technology, social media, po posting things online and learning to track uh, how people are using the information that you're putting out there. Um, lastly, on the extension, uh, keep track of, of impact. Uh, quantitative measures of impact are, are very uh, useful. In addition to testimonials by key influential people within your state and within your region. Uh, service, I have a few things to say about that later, but I'm gonna talk about social games and networks now. Uh, when you are in a department, one of the first things you wanna do is to speak very little and listen a lot. I think that that's a general principle in life. I learned when I was younger that if you don't say much, people don't know how uh, ignorant you are about certain things. Uh, so I learned to listen first and then speak second. Especially when you're a junior faculty in a new institution and department, you want to hold your views to yourself. Yes, you should have opinions, but you want to hold them to yourself initially so that you can understand the culture of, of, of the department, but not just the department, also the culture of the college. Uh, it's also important to know local needs, but beyond knowing the culture of your department, you, you wanna be a national and global player. And we've had several references to that uh, before now. So the, the most valuable currency that we have as professionals is being relevant nationally and globally. If things doesn't work out where you are locally, at least you have a market. So when it comes to research, teaching, extension, and other areas of our work, that is the model that we should be using. But it's very important though, not to ignore uh, the needs of the people uh, in our local area. So know what successful colleagues are doing uh, in your department, but even more so know what they are doing nationally and internationally, especially for those who do international work. Uh, so for folks in extension, I always say, don't just look at our department for your mentors. Look nationally too, to see who is doing really well. Contact them if you have questions. Even if you don't have questions, make them up so that they get to know who you are. Uh, be good citizen of your department and profession. And uh, this is very important because uh, I don't care what anyone tells you, it's not just about your publications. It's about what people think about you as a person. So if you are uh, someone that nobody wants to have around as a colleague because you're rude and you're mean and you don't care about other people, guess what? You could be one of the best scholars. They will be looking for reasons to not support you, not reasons to support you. 
So it's very important to be a good citizen of the department. And there are many different ways that, that you can do that. And I will say, lastly, on the social networks and games, be careful to not be opinionated or too vocal on controversial issues, especially when you're junior faculty, even for senior faculty too. Don't be too opinionated. Uh, we should learn to listen and be inclusive in conversation and be willing to learn from other people too. So to me, those are very important uh, things to consider as you're navigating uh, the tenure process. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about self-improvement uh, uh, self and career growth. You don't want to just uh, stay static in terms of what you've learned in the past in graduate school. I believe that one of the best things that we, uh, we get to do as academics is to use the skill of learning to help us, uh, as someone said earlier, that we are lifelong learners. I, so we need to put that in practice. Um, so mentoring re really, really matters here. Uh, at Michigan State, we have a very uh, 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 deliberate formal mentoring process that we get started. Your first semester, we try to, to set up a mentoring committee uh, for our junior faculty consisting of uh, three faculty members. And it's done in consultation with the, the new faculty because I usually give them a few uh, weeks to be in the department to know uh, various people. And then we'll have a sit down and say, okay, do you have some ideas about who you want on your mentoring committee? And I also provide some, uh, uh, some suggestions and then we'll make a joint uh, decision based on that. Uh, it's important to lean on them and to be proactive in using your mentoring committee. Some people don't use their mentors well. They're waiting for their mentors to come to them instead of them going to their mentors. So it's very important to be proactive in drawing wisdom out of your mentors. I also uh, counsel you to seek mentors outside of your own departments. Uh, come to, to meetings like this and follow up with people that you know are doing work that you respect or can be helpful to you and approach them and ask them to be informal mentors for you. Lastly, on the self-improvement, I would say read widely. Uh, if you don't have time to read, you could listen to books and things uh, on your phone uh, or your computer. I find that the best people, in t uh, going back to, to Maru's presentation, uh, uh, the, the breadth and the, uh, and the depth. You have a lot of breadth when you don't only read economic journals. That really helps that you take some time out to read. It's not a waste of time. It helps you to be creative in your thinking and your ability to actually relate to societal uh, needs. I will close uh, by giving this last advice. I believe that one of the most critical skill set to have is uh, communication skills. We see that in our profession that uh, is lacking and it's lacking at many levels. Uh, you need to improve your writing skills. Uh, if you can invest in, in how to write at the very early stage of your career, it will pay very high dividends. Uh, so what does that mean? And this is from personal experience. A lot of times when we read journal articles, especially when we're, we're in graduate school, we are reading it to find information to cite. I will challenge you to do research on how excellent journal articles are written. Look at a journal article, not to cite them, but to dissect the components of what makes a journal article, the abstract. How are good abstracts written? The introduction, how are things motivated? What, what kind of rationale and justification are given for why a topic is an important one for editors of journals to, to publish? How do you develop a conceptual model? How do you interpret your results? Look at several papers that have been written by well-respected people in the profession and learn how they write and make that a continuous lifelong process. Because when you write well, your chances of getting published in good places definitely improves. And I will close with uh, the second part of communication that I think is also very important. 
and that is verbal communication. Uh, we as academics are required to give a lot of talks and we're going to do it for the rest of our career. So it behooves us to spend some time to actually learn how to do it well. I've seen colleagues who have been in the profession for a very long time uh, and they, they, uh, they're not, uh, they are not growing in their ability to, to communicate because they think it's not that important, especially when you want to communicate with non-economics. Uh, not economists, policymakers, it's very important to know how to, uh, to capture and keep the attention of an audience. It's also important to know what gets people interested in a particular topic uh, and knowing your audience. I've read several books on how to communicate and how to speak publicly. And I think that I have a long way to go, but I would suggest very early on right now that this is an area that uh, will be very fruitful and will pay high dividend if you pay attention to this. Thank you. All right, our uh, fourth speaker for this panel is uh, Steve. <laughs> This one? Uh, short, yeah, okay. <clears throat> and, uh, share it and uh... yeah, share it. This one? This one? Uh, no, no, now we need to go to the slide. Go to slide. No, is this a presentation? Or? No, 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 that's no, not the presentation. No, okay. So the good PowerPoint. That's not the, the PowerPoint oh, okay. slide. Hold on. Let me start yeah. 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 Can we move this yeah. pictures away? So that it is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> from our previous speakers, looks like I'm going to repeat the same points, but I will try to repeat it in my own words. Okay, okay so like everyone said that um, there are basically there are um, um, five different areas yeah, faculty members are uh, obligated to um, uh, work on uh, for the department requirements, okay. So first research, uh, teaching, advising, extension, outreach, and service. Uh, I think I'm not going to focus on extension and outreach because others probably can do a better job than I can, okay. Uh, so focus mostly on research, bit on teaching, little bit on advising, and uh, some limited info on uh, service, okay. Uh, in research, okay. Uh, finding a research topic is very important, okay? Um, several people have uh, said about the same thing, okay? Well, basically, where, where do I find my research topics? Uh, you should find it by reading journal articles, okay? And a lot of my applied policy type of research comes from newspaper articles, Wall Street Journal, and the Economist magazine, okay? And also look at uh, current economic events, for example, uh, the US-China trade war, or farm bills, or uh, Paris agreement, uh, those, are the, those are the current economic events where I would um, get some research topics. And also um, uh, from coursework. Uh, from coursework, um, when I'm reading some new journals to teach, and from there also I uh, get um, ideas to do research. Okay? I'm going to spend more time on coursework a bit later on. Okay? Uh, and all the topics that I select, particularly applied research one, they tend to have real world applications and some policy implications, okay? That way it would be easier to sell you a, a paper, okay? Um, <clears throat> so what are the good features of a research topic? 
think someone may have talked about it quite a bit. So I'm just going to highlight a few points. Okay. The first three points, different from other studies, up to date on the literature and being a new, they all same, say the same thing. Uh, basically, they say um, you don't want to rehash what others have done. That, okay, so that um, uh, you need to be come up with something new on your own. Okay, the topic should be innovative, relevant, should be important, and definitely publishable. Okay, uh, you want to select the topic such that it's publishable. Okay, and also it contributes their literature or to policy analysis or advance the existing literature, okay? So after it meets all this criteria, it should be implementable both theoretically and empirically, okay? Particularly it's empirical oriented studying, okay? You need to know where the data comes from, okay? Most of the time, particularly students or young faculty members, they daydream about the topic, but once they start working on it, they're going to scratch their head, where do I get the data from this, okay? So getting the data is very important in economics. Okay. Uh, type of journal articles uh, that you want to write. Okay. Uh, you can write purely theoretical paper or purely empirical paper, like five of the, my mentees paper, they're all purely empirical paper. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, but a theoretical com empirical paper has um, better, uh, higher ceiling to sell. Okay. When you have a theory, good sound theoretical model, followed with a good empirical analysis, then you, you'd be able to sell it much better in a good journal. Okay? Uh, and also you see paper, if you write any policy oriented uh, applied paper, you can publish in choices article. Um, those are some of the issue paper that you can uh, work on. Okay. Um, this is probably the most important slide I'm going to present in the whole, in my talk. Okay. Uh, if you are in economics or ag economics, you need to realize, okay, PhD, can you see the top line? Is that uh, blocking it? Uh, okay, I don't know how to scroll that, but let me read it. Yeah, uh, PhD degree in economics, agricultural economics is an applied mathematics degree. Okay, you need to know that, okay. Um, <clears throat> that means you need to have a certain amount of math background. I, I would say these are the very bare minimum requirements. Okay? You need to have college algebra, trigonometry, calc 1, calc 2, calc 3, linear algebra, differential equations, and also if you're really good, if you have uh, enough time, getting a mathematical degree in undergraduate is a great idea. Great idea okay? um, <clears throat> in all these courses, can someone tell which is the most important course of the ones I listed? To me, it's college algebra. It's college algebra, okay? Much of my work is theoretical work. 95% of the work involves college algebra, okay? That's a, a very important, okay? And also, you need to have a fairly <coughs> good background in probability theory and statistics. Uh, if you really want to publish good general economics journals without probability theory and statistics, it's very uh, difficult, okay? Uh, and I would also encourage if you can afford, if you have time, get a master's degree in statistics, okay? Particularly at Washington State University, they encourage their students to get a master's in statistics, okay? Uh, it helps um, several ways. It certainly enhances your capability in research, but also they place their students quite a bit in industry, having a degree in master's in statistics that comes handy, okay? And finally, <clears throat> you need to have a strong economic degree background both at the undergraduate level and graduate level. Okay. Um, uh, just a brief background about me. Uh, I came from India and my undergraduate was in agriculture. That means I never took any math course. I do not even know there's a course called college algebra or called one or called two. Okay. So when I came to Iowa State for my PhD, on a good day, I cannot add two plus three. Okay. Uh, so the pitch program was always like uh, looking for a needle in a high stack. Okay? It was just not fun. Okay? Uh, how did I get through? Uh, luckily for me, except micro and econometrics, most of the courses are very descriptive and graph graphical analysis. And to my surprise, it's not only me liking the math background, all my classmates, cohorts, including domestic students, they were liking math. 
and i was helping them it's like a blind leading a blind okay, <laughs> okay. yeah um, uh, i do not know whether you know wayne fuller he's a famous um, ag economist became a statistician and prime science guy his course was just terrible terrible because you don't have any math background you cannot understand anything okay uh, so anyway even for faculty members if you have not taken any of those basic math courses it's not too late to take them okay i will show you a slide how many courses i have taken since my graduation okay uh, it also have <clears throat> strong um, uh, field course if you want to do research very well okay um, <clears throat> finally in this slide i want to say if you leave off your phd courses and do not stay up to date on literature you will be outdated very quickly you will be very quickly will be outdated uh, believe me that okay. um, <clears throat> so um, again covering up um, <clears throat> my phd program was worthless useless okay i did not learn anything okay so well after 3 four years someone asked me a question in calculus 3 okay i opened the book i could not even read a single sentence understand what's going on okay and that's when i realized even though i have phd i am really dumb i am really totally dumb okay so after that i sat in calc 3 and guess what i did not understand maybe i understood about 45 50% of the material do you know why i understood only 50% of the material because i need not have a damn college algebra trigonometry calc 1 calc 2 okay uh, then right after that i went to differential equation there also i did not understand okay then that summer i went to college algebra can you guess who were my classmates are in a summer class any idea huh? ninth grade smart students okay <laughs> yeah i was like uh, i literally cried i am really this stupid to go to class to take college algebra okay guess what once i took college algebra it's a day and night difference for me day and night difference and i took some of these courses particularly the first five six courses i really did not understand because i did not take them sequentially but with my dingy wingy math background i can do theoretical research okay so that's why it's important to take these courses okay and since i graduated i have taken 33 courses and 105 credits math tech courses and ph level uh, agathon general accounts courses as recently as 2015 i was sitting in a phd game theory course okay. so uh, if you really want to do one well research you need to have this kind of course background then only you can do uh, better okay. uh, <clears throat> so in addition to those kind of course background you need to have very strong background in econometrics optimization whether static or dynamic and also good software background in econometrics sas sata or matlab python all those things if you are in programming area gams or matlab gas in the mathematical area math mathematica maples uh, those things will come very handy okay and also in word processing um, math type or lyx latex you need to know that and nowadays uh, most of them students are getting very familiar with machine learning that's become very popular one of my mentees did a work uh, using machine learning okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so in terms of publications uh, it's important that you meet with your head of the department or your mentoring committee get some idea what is needed to get publication so that you can get your promotion tenure nowadays some department require at least you need to have one or two aje to get pnt <laughs> Okay. Uh, and some departments also may require, in addition to one or two AJE, maybe six or seven uh, articles. So get to some idea at the very beginning so that you can aim toward accomplishing those uh, numbers. Okay. Uh, aim for, again, several people mentioned this, aim for both quality and numbers. Okay. If we aim for only numbers, even if you make through your promotion tenure, you cannot sell yourself outside your department. Okay, so aim for both quality and numbers, and if possible, publish in general economic journals. Okay, I am one of those people. Uh, half of my publication is general economics, half in agita. Okay, and right from the beginning, this may be too strong to say that, but you need to operate under a publish or praise mode so that you can um, be successful. Okay, okay. 
regarding the revision, again, several of you talked about that, uh, be prepared to getting bitten up. Okay? They, this happens all the time. Okay? Uh, AJE in what, uh, less than 5% acceptance rate, okay? you need to be prepared. In general economics, higher level journals, you need to be prepared not just getting bitten up from reviewers, but getting bitten up from desk rejection. Okay? Um, <clears throat> reversing the article, uh, don't pick up a fight with the reviewers, editors, even if they are wrong. Okay? It very often it happens, uh, even if they are wrong. Okay? And try to appreciate the reviewers and try to address all the comments best of your ability without arguing with the uh, reviewers. Even if you find the reviewers are wrong, politely put it in a way so that you can tell what's right rather than picking up a fight. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So meet the, uh, now I'm moving on to teaching. Uh, meet the department requirements, particularly for undergraduate teaching, okay? uh, because everybody wants to teach graduate course. There will be nobody to teach undergraduate course. It's, even if it's a day to job, you need to meet the department obligations. Okay? But comes to undergraduate teaching, the one point I want to highlight is, you know, the most important point you have to do in undergraduate teaching the most important thing is to keep those kids awake. If you keep them awake, you can get the points across, okay? So that's very important. I will show you some of my teaching philosophies and also it's published, you can um, look at them, okay? Um, PhD courses, okay, uh, is very important. Yeah, I think if, if you're a faculty, you need to at least talk to the head of the department to talk, teach at least one PhD course. I find teaching PhD micro field courses and quantitative courses come very, very handy to do research. Okay? And the primary goal of teaching PhD course is not to be a good teacher. That's not the primary goal. Uh, I will tell you, you may laugh at me. The primary goal is to aid your research. Okay? If you're good in a subject matter, if you're good in good explanation, being organized, and if you do a good job in teaching, the end result will be you'll be outstanding teacher. But the primary goal will be use the PhD level courses to help your research, okay? And if you're doing well in teaching, uh, talk to your department, aim for departmental teaching award, college, university, and professional association teaching awards. Uh, <clears throat> these are some of the principles of my teaching and the next slide I show where you can find all the details, okay? Um, I always do assign the readings in advance, okay? I tell the students, these are the materials I'm going to cover next class and the following class, you better read it. Okay? And how do I know whether they are going to read or not? At the very beginning of each lecture, I give a quiz to test whether they read that material or, or not. It's not a very in-depth quiz, but just superfluously, just make sure they read the material. All my classes, I have typed lecture notes. Okay? My classes are very organized on both individual lecture and overall course and step-by-step -step explanation is very important. And also you need to have good subject matter expertise. Graduate students, they know very easily, very quickly, whether you know the materials or not. You, can, you are not going to pull them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> class participation and discussion is very important. I always give extra points. Sometimes I take the students for lunch, okay? Because when the students participate, they're going to be very active in learning, that helps, okay? And for an undergraduate class, okay, uh, the way I keep them awake is by telling jokes. By telling jokes, I have a, in a particular uh, semester, I usually have about 200 cartoons and other things. Okay? I show them just to keep them awake. Okay? Uh, that's the most important for undergraduate um, teaching. Okay? And I always give real world examples, real world examples to relate to the class material, particularly in the undergraduate class that helps. Okay? And also pay attention to each individual student's name. Okay? My undergraduate class is about 70 students. Within two or three weeks, I know each student's name. So that means I can call up on any students at any time to ask questions. And they generally appreciate that. They sometimes, wow, he knows my name. Okay. So that, that helps. Okay. Uh, so my teaching philosophy, both uh, graduate teaching philosophy and undergraduate teaching philosophy are published in these journals. Okay. So if you want to take a look at, um, you are welcome. Each one has about 30 points. Okay. Uh, moving on to um, uh, mentoring, graduate mentoring. Okay. Uh, I recruit students by myself. 
I never take students from the pool of applicants come can, uh, because uh, most of the applicants, at least my industries, they come from developing countries or our own agribusiness students. They simply do not have any math background or economic theory background. Okay? So I, what I do is I recruit my own undergraduate students because I, I teach a uh, senior level course. I take students from there. There are some good students. I tell them, hey, you are good enough to come to graduate school. And I give them at least a year, year and a half to take these math courses, stat, probability, and economic theory courses, okay? and so that they can uh, do very well. Okay? And most of the students who listen to me have taken these courses, they have done extremely well. Okay? I'm going to tell a story of two students. Okay? Uh, one student is currently at Illinois. Um, he came from Western Washington. His undergraduate was uh, history, first two years. Then he decided to change to economics and he took economic courses. So basically he did not have any math background, zero, zero math background. Uh, he came to um, actual Washington State. We, I was teaching, co teaching a course, and he took my trade, graduate trade course. I thought he's a fairly good student, uh, not a A plus or anything, fairly good student. And I told him, I have money, I can give you assistantship, but you need to take this kind of courses, everything else. So in two years, he took 33 credits of courses required for Agacon plus thesis. From the thesis, we published uh, four papers. In addition, he took 40 credits of mathematics and statistics course, okay? And with all those things he accomplished in two years, so I sent him to um, uh, University of Colorado, not Colorado State, but nothing against uh, that, nothing against Colorado State, okay? I sent him to University of Colorado, okay? Uh, <laughs> University of Colorado, because they had the, one of the top departments in trade, okay? I sent him there and um, <clears throat> he did really well and he applied to Illinois. I, I wrote a very strong, very strong letter, but from Illinois, Scott Terwin called me, hey, Stephen, I understand you wrote a very strong letter, but I still want to ask you, uh, what do you think of this student? I wrote only one sentence. You are not going to hire any student better than him. Okay? So they offered the job right after the interview in the department. Okay? Uh, that's a bill readily, Madhukanna knows that. Okay? Um, currently, I have one student, uh, his undergraduate was um, uh, ag science and plant science. Again, did not have any math background. So um, two years ago in my trade course, undergraduate trade course, uh, he was doing really well, participating very well. I told him, hey, you do want to come to graduate school. He said, I already have a job, I already have a job. That's what most students say. But I kept on pressing him, you are good enough to do that, okay? And finally, I convinced him to come. He's just like William Ridley, in the last year and a half, he has taken a dozen math courses, six um, <clears throat> state courses, and uh, currently doing masters with me in uh, Agge Khan. Uh, guess what he's going to do? Uh, he's going to go to math department to get masters in mathematics and statistics, and then what? And his backup plan is Berkeley Agge Khan, East Davis Agge Khan, but he wants to apply to MIT and Harvard for general economics, okay? Because he's that good, okay? Uh, he's doing really well. Okay? All his grades are not A, but A plus, not 100, but 120, because he gets all the bonus points. So he's doing really well. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so several of my students went through this kind of rigorous math courses, have done well. One student at um, Washington State faculty, Jeff Flux said, uh, he's also doing extremely well. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I tell my students and give them extra year or two to take these uh, math courses, okay? And they have do, done very well. And <clears throat> I generally work with, with my students about 10 to 12 hours a day with my graduate students, okay? Uh, one of the reasons is um, I have an injury problem. I cannot write, I cannot use computers. This since 1994 when I started my academic career. So most of the way, the way I get research work done is by spending a lot of time with my current students and my past students. With Jeff Luxford, I work with him five to six hours a day, five to six hours a day. Okay. Uh, that's the way I'm putting food on my table. Okay. Um, <clears throat> including my evenings, night and weekends, I work with my graduate students. Okay. Uh, I mentored uh, students, mostly MS students. I was at Idaho for a long time, uh, now at Texas Tech. Uh, we do have a PhD program, but um, 
most of my publications were with my master students. I helped them to get about 85 journal articles in, and help them to receive a total of 66 awards at department level, college level, news level. The one thing I'm most proud of is getting about 13 AIA, WAA, and Southern Agathon PhD dissertation and thesis awards. Okay. So I'm uh, very appreciative of working with good students. To me, the first thing is publishing a good journal article in a good journal gives me a lot of pleasure. And the second most thing that gives me pleasure is helping a very good graduate student. Uh, <clears throat> so my recommendation to graduate students, anybody are here, okay, uh, it's important to work with a good major process. Okay? Uh, most important person in your academic life is your major process. Okay? Mm -hmm. Those of you who are placing students all over, you will know okay, um, that good graduate students, okay, it's important to work with very uh, productive faculty members. Okay? Um, <clears throat> This uh, general uh, information, navigating departmental politics, okay? uh, stay focused on your work. Just close your, all the extra noise, close your ears, okay? focus on your work, okay? avoid troublemakers, problem causers. In every department, there are people always like that. Okay? Avoid them. Uh, you need to know how to handle difficult people. Okay? Don't get caught up in um, crossfire, rumor mining, gossip. They are not going to help you. They're not going to help you. Okay? Uh, work with the faculty members with a similar interest. Okay? Work with very productive faculty members. Okay? Get mentoring help from experienced faculty members. Okay? Uh, and also work with your past major professors or advisors. Uh, have a good network. Okay? Those things all will come very handy. Okay? Um, <clears throat> regarding publications, I want to tell one thing. You really need to publish like three to four in a very good journal. That means you need to have about 10 to 12 good quality manuscripts in pipeline. Okay. Only when you have that many in pipeline, you can publish three to four uh, good journal articles. Okay. Uh, after getting PNT, if you're doing well, very academically, uh, participate in professional services in uh, AAA, WAA, Southern, Agribusiness, International Agacon, all those things. Okay. Serve on award committee, selected papers committee, be secretary, treasurer. Okay and also in the editorial service. Later on, when you get full professorship, you can run for directorship and presidential, uh, be a presidential candidate for AIA or uh, other um, regional associations. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, final slide, I think, allocate your time judiciously, okay. uh, be collegial, be a team member. Uh, again, what goes around comes around. Okay. You don't want to earn a bird name. It can last for long. Okay. Uh, the final, Point is, this is very important to me. Uh, be honest with your collaborators. That's why <clears throat> Jeff like said, I am collaborating for about 20 years. 20 years. Okay. Uh, since his master's program, we have been collaborating with William Ridley. I am collaborating for seven years. Okay. So it's important to be honest with your collaborators. Okay. I do have a lot of other slides. I do have about uh, 10 slides. Um, uh, Titus talked about verbal and written communication. The written communication itself, I have about uh, uh, 10 slides. If any of you want to know, I will pass on my slides to others. So with that, I will end the, uh, my talk, okay? So we'll actually collect this material and along with the recording and make that available. Uh, we'll archive it somewhere so we can have it. This is just, you know, such a wealth, of, it's a gold mine of, of um, advice that I think is so useful. Um, all right, so we have time for uh, questions, um, about 15 minutes or so. So I encourage people to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, so my question has to do with, I guess, sometimes the differences between trying to publish in an ag econ journal, or if you have a paper that you feel like fits in a general interest journal, it seems like my understanding, what I've been told is that in econ, it's a little different. They tend to workshop their papers longer. They try to get more comments, but I'm curious about how should, if we think something fits in general interest journal and we want to publish even like try for a top five, how should our process be different or the same? in an ag econ journal. Uh, 
so if you have very high quality journal sensitive to general economics okay we publish on top general economics general economics journal of international international economics a review of um, econ and stat okay no agricultural department is going to say you do not publish in agricultural journal okay they are all very good top journals they are respective for publishing that so you should not be worrying about or oh, my department is going to say that you are not publishing in agricultural okay publishing those top journals are really good The thing, thing is, a lot of time in econ, you, you go through the seminar route. Now, but this is especially true with uh, graduate students, they go to NBR and all these other places. Now, a lot of time, I, when I started, I published uh, quite a lot in the uh, econ journal and I continue. Generally speaking, you have to give one or two seminars, even in your department, and you can get the feedback. And if you have two or three people that you really appreciate, you generally only ask them about papers that are really unique. I don't really send a really good paper. Uh, I don't send every, uh, every paper that I write to people for opinion because then I will ex uh, exhaust their uh, patient. But if you have one or two papers, and get, this is a really good paper, then you send them and you ask for a favor. What really is better is that you get a good reading from one or two or three people that you appreciate that will read it, then have 500, uh, uh, 100 uh, readers. Secondly, uh, papers are not like wine. You don't like them to get old. You publish, and generally, the most important theorem that I learned was what the Endlich-Schmidt theorem, the envelope theorem. You get rejected in one, from one journal, you put it in an envelope and send it to another journal. So to some extent, yeah. if you have a paper, get one or two, one or two feedbacks. If people don't give you a response in, in a week or two, you have to ask them gently, you didn't respond because you think it's a terrible paper or, be, or because you were busy. And they will tell you the truth. And that's it. Don't let the paper stay around. We don't have NBR, but we survived. So to some extent, you really have to move uh, to Can move as fast. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, Shelley. Do you want to uh, just unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I was just wondering on the point of transitioning across new and important topics in agricultural economics throughout one's career. Do you all have advice for staying on top of research that's based on current events or upcoming events, um, but still maintaining a cohesive research agenda for a promotion and tenure? I was going to talk about the previous topic, but I can <laughs> I can talk about that too. Uh, I think I think you can submit to an econ journal without without having a bunch of people without doing that route. But I think it helps, and it seems like the general interest econ journals can be more clubby, you know. So so you have to keep that in mind. It, but it's just something to think about. And then the other the other thing I was on that topic, I was just wondering. And then I'll get, I'll get back to the. The topics, but uh, it seems like in AgiCon, it's been more people are publishing in, like trying to publish for one of the nature or science journals, you know, and that, and it doesn't seem like that would happen very much. It happens a little bit in general economics, but I think that that's something that is that AgiCon departments value. And I mean, of course, it has huge impact, you know, the impact factors are off the charts. You know, David has published in Science a few times, Science Magazine a few times. Uh, so on the on the staying, you the question was uh, staying topical. So I I really think it's important to to read read newspapers or just stay up on stay up on events and and talk about things and then and and I think that helps you that can help you uh, come up with interesting topics. I also think it's good to look at uh, look at calls for grants, you know, because these are emerging issues often. And um, and that can 
that can make maybe make you think about, oh, this is what I might study that could also possibly be funded and think about how that fits in with your research agenda. So, so uh, just some comments, thanks. So re regarding the research topic, uh, reading a Wall Street Journal, I really pick up a lot of ideas to do research okay? uh, because they are a bit more critical. They look at pros and cons on both sides. Okay? So that helps you to make think, uh, maybe this is the area that I should work on, uh, that helps. And I always read the uh, current AJE articles or uh, any other area that you are working on, read the current art articles that gives you a history of what has been done in the past. That way you can also stay up to date. Okay. Uh, Final one point on the graduate mentoring, it's not a good idea to think working with uh, graduate students is a waste of time. Okay. We get a good students, you can have a long term uh, collaboration for 10, 15 years. That will be really useful. Just like you are getting mentors from others, you can mentor those students and have a long term collaboration. Can you address the second point where you're saying, how do you maintain the cohesive research agenda given that you want to address the relevant topics? Oh, that, that, that's a good point. Okay. Uh, you don't want to spread your wings. Uh, too far, okay? Stay focused on what you are good at, okay? Stay fo focused on what you are good at. And even the current events, work on the topics related to your area uh, so that you can still have a very organized, uh, very cohesive uh, research agenda that you can focus on. Okay. So I can talk a little bit about, you know, this topic, that, this question that you just raised, Shelly. And, um, uh, you know, as somebody who, in the course of my own, uh, just the first five years during before uh, tenure, I worked on three different topics, and and I my dissertation was on power plants in India, uh, carbon emissions, and then I worked on precision farming in the Midwest, and then I worked on how to reduce toxic releases from manufacturing um, industrial plants uh, voluntarily in the U.S. And so that would seem like a lot, and and what is the connection between them, but for me, I could see the connection between them and it all related to how uh, essentially came out that one simple thing of it is really about how inputs are used in the production process and the efficiency of doing that. And I could tell a story with that that showed the thread through my work that, um, you know, made sense. So, uh, so that's sort of one the thing is really, it's for you to be able to tell the story of your research program. And if you can see the connection, you can you know, uh, articulated. Uh, the other um, thing is that, uh, you know, for uh, each of these things that you pick up, um, you know, don't just, it, it, it's not just one paper on one topic and another one on another topic. It's like you really dig in deep into each one of these topics and have five or six papers around that thing. So, so that you, you know, it's, there is something to it. It's not just sort of flitting from one topic to another and just scratching the surface, but you really get into it. And so that's another way to uh, be able to work on different things, but still show that you are, you know what you're doing. Thank you all. I just want to, I just want to add something. This is um, the importance of Twitter. I've actually, you know, um, gained new information quite a bit from Twitter, believe it or not, right? Because um, a lot of the latest trends and topics are being discussed on Twitter. Uh, I just want to emphasize that it's really important for us applied economists to be up to date with the latest methods. Um, and um, just going to the AEA continuing education program um, every now and then uh, is really helpful. A few years ago, I attended the machine learning workshop that was um, taught by Susan Athey and Guido Imbens and all this. And I started using them in, in some of my papers. Um, um, and now machine learning can be used for causal inference, right? I mean, it's amazing. You know, it used to be a predictive tool, but now. There are techniques um, using causal force and so on that can be used for causal inference. Uh, one more thing um, uh, is uh, the importance of being a, a chronic finisher. So remember those two words. Uh, I've supervised a lot of graduate students and postdocs and, and so on. And one characteristic that I really emphasize to them, and this is really hard for most people, I don't know why, is to always finish papers. 
right? And revise papers and submit them. Uh, I remember, uh, was it Brorson? I think, uh, what's Brorson's first name? Wade, Wade Brorson. Uh, he said when he was editor, he was amazed that a majority of the revise and resubmits in AJE were not resubmitted. That just blows my mind. If you get a revise and resubmit, you got to work on it. That's the big major step, right? Is to get a revise and resubmit given, given the low acceptance rate. So remember those two words. <laughs> Okay, one of the things that uh, Jinji said is you have to like the topic that you work on. A lot of time, I think that really, to me, that really started my career. A lot of time, you have no choice. Like I remember, I came to Berkeley and they said, gosh, uh, we have money to someone to work on animal waste. That wasn't my dream topic. <laughs> <laughs> and so the question... <laughs> No, 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 but, but no, but, 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 but what happened is that I start to say, what do, what, what can I do with animal waste? And basically what I did is, then what I did is, I start really looking. So I, the first paper was a AJ paper, it was a trade-off between, uh, it was a trade-off between uh, uh, some sort of uh, cows versus waste. And then I start really developing uh, several papers that really use animal waste as an example of trade-off between taxes and subsidies. All my career is based, actually, to be honest, I published a paper in Econometrica based on the same story. And the thing about it is that after a while, I start liking it. But the key element, the topic is not that interesting. But there are two things that I did. First, I spoke with a lot of people about it. They pay me money. I did know nothing about animal waste. I don't have cows. I didn't have a dog then. So I went. <laughs> <laughs> so I start going and speaking with people. And then and then I learn about what it is. Then I got some data about it. So once you have data and you have a story and you make it like an economic problem, it was really very, very, uh, very, very attractive. Not only that, because no one else want to work on uh, animal waste. I got a grant for eight years that I had to give the money back after several years. So a lot of time, a topic that people want to deal with and no one want, uh, want to touch, it's good if you see how to make it uh, attractive. Yeah, I think the challenge is not, uh, not fine. Important topic. There's a lot of important topic, uh, hot topic out there. It's easy to find those topic. I think the real challenge is to find something, find a topic you can say something new and important about it. So that's the challenging part. So there's a lot of, so, you know, that's it's a, even though you find some, you know, find a topic you can say something new, then you have to pop. That's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. But that that's that the new and uh, innovative part you're working on has to be, has to be important. <laughs> that's the net, other hurdle you have to pass. So that's, that's Nick, to me, that's the most challenging part. You know, there's a lot of hot topic, a lot of important topic. It's not easy, it's easy to find those topics. You know, you just read the newspaper, you know, you can easily identify those, uh, you know, important topic, the hot topic. But the question is, how do you find a topic, hot topic that you could see something that's really, really important, that really, really valuable. People appreciate reading that. Uh, that's the challenging part. Good morning, everyone on Zoom and here in the room. Looks like we have uh, most of everybody back who is going to be able to. I know we, we've lost a few people that had to travel back and things like that, but, uh, but you know, uh, we're here. Uh, so we're going to start today. It's all about, you know, what are some of the big questions that are um, going to be attractive for funding? 
and um, in Ag and Applied Economics. We've got um, John Tilmany who will start off and then Robin Shoemaker. And then uh, if there's anything still left to be said, I'll try to say that after that. So um, start with John. It's already shared screen, it looks like. So let's get this thing off. Oh. Isn't the mouse isn't working? Do you have the thing in? The taco? Or is it a Bluetooth? I want to close this. Good morning, everybody. And of course, I've already made the first mistake in the fact that I updated this from the last time I gave this to uh, a workshop uh, from 17 and didn't change the date. So now you know my secrets. But I did this morning, as Mary can attest, update it given some of the themes I've heard come up. Um, but as you might guess, with grant writing and fundraising, there's some principles that aren't going to change much over time. So I kind of gave it this silly title just because perhaps the first big challenge in navigating grants is getting to the, used to the world of acronyms that you will have thrown at you as you try to understand how to navigate those. So um, we won't spend time on, on the specific uh, acronyms, but uh, just to make you realize for all the training you had in grad school, unless you had a really dedicated mentor who decided part of your professional development was gonna be grant writing, um, there's a whole different set of training you almost need to think about when you go into the grant world. So I'm going to I'm going to navigate a little bit back and forth between how to write a good grant, how to put together a good team and proposal to I think to to set Robin up well and what I see is also trends in what's going on in terms of what's funded. So obviously the key issues to consider and the good news for all of you is that um, between the traditional programs that are out there being back to being funded pretty well and running at their normal pace and the new initiatives coming out of DC and the ARPA money and the CARES money, there, if, if you can't find a pocket to fund your research in, you're not looking because um, it's perhaps been the most um, ample time out there for there to be funding opportunities. And that's just in the government space. And of course, there continues to be a proliferation of foundations interested in what we do. But it is a little bit of a trick to find the right fit for your program and figure out where, you know, first, like yesterday, I told you, know who you want to be as a professional and what you want to do. Do not change your focus and identity to chase money. Um, it is not worth it. Keep doing what you want to do and then just find the programs that's a good fit for it. Although if it, it nudges you one direction because you're kind of broadly interested in, say, um, water quality, if, if, if it nudges you to look at water quality in the context of how food companies are using that for a new sustainability metric um, in their supply chains, be willing to be nudged a direction, but um, don't, 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 don't make chasing money the reason you pick topics. Um, I would say, and I'm going to spend more time on this than I used to, that assembling the right team and management plan and making sure some people think the big win is to get a grant and, and get the money. Um, because reputations matter, I would now say really your success is when that project gets its outcomes, gets published well, presented well, and reflects well on the agency's mission. Um, so that means you have to make sure once you get the money, um, people think the impacts you had with that money were, were worth it. Um, and I'm sure Robin will talk about that a little bit. And so as even Madhu challenged us in with the presidential address, if you're gonna go both deep and broad, you might have to learn, maybe not in your first five years pre-tenure, but you're gonna learn have to learn how to manage teams and pretty complex, diverse teams. But that starts with first just being a team member and very actively watching and paying attention to what makes teams work or not. So I'm going to spend a little more time on team science than I used to in the past. So this is just something I put together um, as we, I work in food systems, as you know, as we talked about a food, as a food systems team, where, what metrics are out there. And the reason I want to bring up metrics is <clears throat> really when you start thinking about how you would write a grant, besides the things we worry about, which is getting publications and having a high esteemed career, really what the grants want to know is what metrics you're going to be able to evaluate to say you had an impact or outcome. Well, I work again in extension. So sometimes that's very direct. That's me actually going and measuring 
five years later, how many farmers are still in business that went through Ever Getting Farmers program. But even for those of us who are maybe at a step higher level of, of framing what a successful um, um, uh, tomato disease prevention program would be is, even if we're not doing the measuring, I think part of our research really has to pay attention to thinking down the road of how our research would help frame what would be the metrics for the USDA or the EPA or the NIH to measure what's an outcome. So when you're starting to think about the language you use and the focus you have with some of your projects, particularly if they're integrated and applied, you'd wanna start thinking in, in terms of almost the metrics you could imagine um, laying out that your research is going to help to inform. So again, at your guys' level where it's not extension always like I do, that would be justifying why a metric is the right metric for what a, 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 an important outcome would be in, in spaces. Um, timing really matters when you start thinking about funding. Um, some people will even start crafting an idea for something they want funded before they ever see an RFP, knowing it can be tweaked. Because quite honestly, though, even when they give eight weeks, 12 weeks, it goes faster than you think. Um, I would usually do it like a chess game where I figure out when I have to have it to my research sponsored program office for them to still like me. And I, I start backing out weeks of when I have to have stuff done and pulled in together. Because for most grants of any size at all, and by that I mean six digits, it, there's usually a packet that ends up being somewhere around 80 to 100 pages, even if it's virtual. And the research office really, really likes it if you tell them immediately that in about eight weeks, you're gonna be hearing from me, so it doesn't surprise them. And if they have any workflow management system, they know you're gonna be part of their workflow the week you do plan to get it to them. So really, this is meant to say, the narrative might seem overwhelming. It's usually 18 pages or so, but actually I've always found that's probably about one fourth of the work of putting a grant together if you're a PI. So this leads to my other discussion. There was a, a question yesterday about if a, you should be a PI um, pre-tenure. In our department, we don't require it. We'd love to have you on a grant as a team member, but we don't have as a requirement because of what I just said. The true science part of this, the narrative is one fourth of the work. So if you can find a senior colleague or a team you can plug into, where someone can do that other three fourths of the work, or you can offer to be a good team member and do a little bit of the three fourths of the work, and you can focus on helping them make a really well crafted narrative, that would be better up through your first few years. That's my opinion. And in our department, there isn't an expectation. If you're not even invited to a team in your first five years, then we get suspicious about if you're really making the network you need. Um, and we could talk, I, I'll take too long if I go through every bullet point, but, um, and budget is probably one of the trickiest things to develop as well, get mentored on that. Um, and this is something where I've always found this is where the program officers with a program can be the most helpful um, because you can certainly send them a draft and they can quickly tell you um, if you're on board or your research office generally is pretty good in that space as well. Um, my, my one point I wanna make about a budget and this comes from, I guess I should have introduced myself better. I, I'm a professor, but um, because Robin Shoemaker likes me so much, I've ran more grant panels than I probably should have in my lifetime. So some of this isn't from me being clever. Some of this is from me being on enough grant panels and seeing the patterns of what does get funded and what's successful, what makes it really easy to evaluate a project and what doesn't. And I would tell you, if you get offered, I go back and forth on whether you should be on grant review panels pre-tenure. Um, I was really unsuccessful getting grants until I was on my first grant panel. And literally the year after I was on my first grant panel, I think I've never not had a year I've been funded since. It really, really makes you absorb and pick. And I, I took it very seriously too, but it really makes you absorb really good grant writing skills to see um, the diversity of how they're developed and see the ones that get funded. So if, if you get asked and you're feeling pretty confident about where you are and you're in your progress to tenure, I would recommend it maybe more towards your fourth and fifth year, not your first or second year, um, because this is where you learn some of this. But what I found with the budgets particularly is you can have a whole narrative and have a budget and a management plan that doesn't line up with the narrative at all. And smart reviewers are going to figure that out. So if you say, yeah, we're going to be super applied and we're going to go engage the community and so forth, and less than 5% of your budget is spent on anything to do with being in the field or cooperating with the industry or the community or whatever, a reviewer is going to say, well, this isn't realistic then. That, they're, they're, this, that's not going to be a third of their work. It's going to be 
75% of the work. So it doesn't have to be a one for one correlation, but you really should look at your budget and see if it reflects the same things you're saying you're gonna do in your scope of work. Um, we've really in extension, um, but also if you work with industry or you work with community groups, gotten into using advisory boards and giving stipends to people. Anytime we're thinking someone's gonna invest more than 10 hours in helping us with our project, either through um, guidance, being a key stakeholder, whatever, we now do build in stipends and advisory boards. And those, those are received well by most of the grantors we work with as being, again, a very strong single indication that they are truly gonna be embedded in the project team and not just um, window dressing. Um, in direct cost recovery, we had a talk a, a talk about that the other night. Um, they're now up in the 40 to 55% range, depending on what agency you're in. They're very real. So before you go out and start over-developing a team and over-promising budget, you really do need to do your budget and back out what you really have of that $500,000 left to commit to people. It, that has been, that has been a, a challenge for a lot of people because they'll go and build a team thinking they have a half million dollars. And then it's not fun to go back to a team and say, I know I could give you two months for your summer. I have to only give you one month because I didn't, I forgot about IDC. So just there's some small rules of, of thumb you, know, you need to think about when you do a budget. And again, think like a reviewer, think about how the reviewer is gonna see the story you're trying to paint, the outcomes you're trying to promise, the impacts for your field you're trying to promise. And again, um, as you develop your budget and your work plan, can they imagine how they translate linearly and this is, Madhu and I were talking last night, she's way more linear than I am. I'm a very, uh, I, I jump around a lot, which is a problem, but one place I got good at being very linear is in scope of works for budgets. Just walk them through exactly how those three research questions are going to get addressed for the three years you have and how that directly translates to what people need to be working on it and how those people are being resourced in the budget. If you even have to make a like spreadsheet matrix, just do it. Um, so you got funded. Yay. Exciting. All the work's done, right? No. Um, so uh, post-award management is probably where I had my biggest shock of learning. And luckily I was on a team before I had to lead a team, but even on the team I was just a part of and learning how to navigate that was a little um, tricky. And that's why I think a lot of the funders now actually really prompt us and nudge us to think about that in the actual grant proposal more so than they used to. So um, the triple bottom line of project management, I always say like, it's about people, respecting people, understanding people are wired differently and how you manage those people are wired differently, um, publications and programs and making sure you have outcomes, not just the last year of your grant, but you actually honor whoever's funding you by trying to get even initial or early results or impacts out as quickly as possible and always attributing them wherever you can with little bylines in the bottom. And then professionalism and just understanding that things are not gonna go smoothly, but whether you get invited back to teams or not, or people accept your invitation to be on teams or not is gonna be completely based on how they felt coming out of that project. And, and as I, I will always say, and, and Robin likes it when I do this, acknowledge your funder. Do not make it secret who is funding your work. Um, almost be annoying about telling everybody who's funding your work and how happy you are with them. Um, <clears throat> so project management from day one, um, like I said, if at all possible, seed this with your department head or your mentor or your experiment station director or your agency lead that you want to be invited onto projects and you want to learn by being on a good project team so that you can kind of absorb some of those skills. Um, and then once you're in those teams, really build relationships. Don't way overdo it, but every place that you can step in and be helpful, even when you're not directly paid for it in the scope of work, offer to do that because hiccups happen. And that project manager having someone on their side helping them out um, is great. Um, but do do even though even though you want to be invited to the team once you're invited, don't be shy about negotiating the role you want to have with it. And um, that uh, it is not enough just to say you're learning from amazing people that you know. You need the grad student, you need a summer month, you need the resources you need. So be gracious about being invited, but that doesn't mean you have to just kind of lay down and accept not taking the same amount of resources the senior members get. So I'm not going through this, obviously, but logic models keep going back and forth on whether USDA needs them or not. I got actually used, used to having to do them, but I'm just putting it up here, not for you to read, but to say, what I did find useful about them is again, they made you think about what are you gonna say your impacts from this project are? 
and walk back through the steps to get there. I will not do them ever if they're not required and so forth, but it did teach me the lessons of that chess game again of even if it's just in a narrative and a story, making it as crystal clear as possible to the funder or the grant review panel what you're trying to do. What we're finding to be more useful now is project management plans. I have been on grant panels where someone has a project management plan that is three sentences of how they're gonna to get together weekly. And that's the project management plan. That is not very convincing to a reviewer that that has the structure you need. Plus, quite honestly, you wanna get this figured out before the grant comes in because if everybody's expectations are different, you as the younger person are most likely to come out of that in a bad place, quite honestly. So this is this is like what we would put in for a typical management plan where we would have our key research questions or objectives up on the top, um, <clears throat> talk about the team that would be supporting the primary person on our team leading that. And then as you can see down below, translate that into kind of a timeline. Either quarter, usually we do quarterly, you don't need to do monthly. If you do something like an economic development administration grant, they'll make you do monthly, but um, the, I quarterly is what economic research service cooperative agreements require. Um, USDA AFRI actually does not require um, anything more than annual, but I think just for your team's health, you, you just might, uh, quarterly is like a good bite-sized chunk. And we actually got to a point where even in our, our team right now, we're just trying this where, because everybody just forgets, we made a, um, a Google form where they get sent a survey every quarter. So while it's still fresh in their mind, because most of us only think of reporting on an annual basis, every quarter we say, recall what you've done over the last three months for this project, fill it in quickly. And we kind of automated it so it didn't feel so onerous. And that's actually been received really well by the team because we're kind of compiling it as we go then. And I'd be happy to show you an example if you want. Uh, so this is, I added a couple slides after hearing some of your discussions, um, and this may be useful for you or not. Um, but Stanford put out a report that my university, Colorado State, has kind of refined a bit to serve our purposes about um, what real engaged scholarship is. If you didn't know this, there's like this new push out to have en engaged universities, and you actually, your university can apply to be qualified for one based on how much engagement it has. Well, obviously the land grants were well set up to be the first in the door with this. I think Purdue was the first one who went officially there. We're there now. But it's this idea of whether it's formal extension or not, which I do, there's a whole ton of ways to be an engaged scholar. And so we took this article from Stanford and actually built it out a little bit where you, from left to right is level of engagement. So some of us are just asked to come out and give workshops and share information, give fact sheets and so forth. That's kind of those couple left two pieces in form and consult. And for some grants that are purely research, that is probably those activities in research, teaching and service are probably enough. But if you're going for an integrated grant where they want, if they use the word engaged, uh, extension, applied, integrated out of USDA, we're really pushing people to think of those right-hand side activities. And this is where I talk about, this is where you'd even see it in the budget, that there was advisory groups or you were giving stipends to producers who were actually um, tracking a data point for you over two years or so forth. And so it's almost like we're using the word co-creation that they actually almost can sense from the motivation of your grant that that question came directly from an interaction you had with a producer, like David was saying yesterday, that manure question came right to my door through a discussion with a producer. Um, and, and so I, I'm challenging my faculty now in my department, only a third of us are extension, but I actually was great last year when I did a prior year program review, every single faculty in our department was at least to the involved stage uh, in, in some of their research. So I would say, and Robin can speak to this later, that trend is not going away. So that's something I, I, I wanted to bring up is really top of mind with a lot of people right now to make sure we have relevant research. The other thing that I've learned over the last five years, our vice president of research started realizing we were doing really, really good at Colorado State with half million dollar grants, million dollar grants, but we weren't landing the big $10 million things. So um, they started seeding some of us around campus who had been fruitful with what was called SIP money. And I don't even know what that acronym stands for anymore. But the, the thing I've really learned from that is this idea of team science. And it comes actually out of the sociology literature, I believe. <clears throat> but what we show here is we brought a team together, some of which had never met each other before, but we needed their skill set. 
So at the start of this project, we actually did this pretty complex survey about who you knew, who you called for answers, who you were learning most from the project, and that was 2017 on the left. But then now at the end of the project, part of one of the outcomes we're giving, well, well first to the Vice President of Research to show we've built a stronger team on campus, but then to the funder, because we did get a FAR uh, Future Food and Agriculture grant under Becca Jablonski, is we one of our outcomes is how we, how we to the right-hand side, you can see the number of nodes between our team members, and the complexity really grew. So this is actually a chapter that's coming out in a book me and Christian Peters are doing on food systems modeling. But it's this idea that um, there's actually a science behind how you put a team together and how you measure their progress in working together. And that was actually quite new to me. And then you, uh, you can't read down the bottom, but then it, the color coding is basically this idea, again, Madhu, I think set this up in her presidential address, everyone wears different hats. You do not need only rigorous researchers on these teams. We have, we have people called boundary crossers. And again, there's a whole science behind this. Boundary crossers, domain experts, process innovators, rigorous researchers, skilled communicators, systems thinkers, team players. And so that also gives people permission to be more respectful of each other, that not everybody should play all those roles and that we respect even the people, sometimes we have this tendency to have a caste system of the most rigorous researchers get the power. This puts them in the context of they are a really important node, but if you look at the people in the middle here, they, they had to be wearing four different hats. And, and so the, the, I can't even get into it all, but it, it was one of the more fascinating things I learned. And I think it's something we could spend more time on because economists always end up looking good in this diagram. When we did this for our team, us economists, shine. So it's another way to heighten also our field's importance in being connectors and rigorous researchers and domain experts. So with that, um, I'll end, but I'll say the other thing I would say is, my word is gratitude. A lot of people will help you bring a grant across the finish line. Be super gracious, particularly to your research office. They can be your best friends and help you uh, troubleshoot a lot of things. And I'm sorry if I took too much time, but uh, thanks, thanks for letting me talk, Madhu. All right, uh, let's transition to uh, Robin. Uh, Robin, do you, do you have slides or? No, no, I. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't have slides, but um, ironically, I was looking back through some old uh, pre presentations and I found one from 2017. I thought, well, who's, who's going to present an old, you know, an old uh, presentation from 2017? Oh, Robin. <laughs> Uh, and and and, uh, and thank you, Don, for setting up so much. I almost um, um, well, I did. I really appreciate that because I really want to. I will uh, reiterate uh, many of those points. Are really, I think they're. I think they're excellent points and really important. And, and I'll touch on those. Uh, but so the first thing I want to do is just mention some um, you know broad areas of uh, research that we we really think are important. Um, and, and some of this is kind of obvious, but I was I was actually going to I draw drew from um, the secretary secretary Vilsack's prior, priorities that he uh, identified um, early in his in his second tenure, and they include things like uh, resilient food systems. Um, and this really, you know, uh, COVID really shocked the system in in many ways. Uh, it, it, the you know the food system is set up for um, you know. Uh, you know, safe times, and what we learned is it's really not, uh, it's not resilient, it's not responsive to um, the shocks that we observed as a result of, of COVID. So, you know, we really need to begin to think about um, alternative systems, what might work, uh, distributed systems, um, and, you know, it, in many ways, it's sort of this trade-off between sort of an efficient system versus, um, you know, one that's more adaptable, and, and can that be um, uh, a, a, an efficient system as well. So there's a whole, a whole uh, variety of research along those lines that, that needs to be pursued. Um, the, the next really big area is, again, climate change, um, which is becoming more and more um, imperative. Um, and some of the important roles which agriculture can play is looking at ca carbon markets, you know, carbon credits, um, and understanding how those markets can work efficiently and, and I, think, I think the other big question, and, and this is gonna be a theme uh, throughout all these, is looking at the equity impacts um, of those. Are, you know, are, are um, the carbon markets, are they more effective for large, large producers and therefore excluding 
uh, smaller operations, um, and, and those kind of questions. Um, and in practice adoption, you know, um, you know, this is a perennial problem with conservation policy and, and natural resource management, but it's the, you know, getting uh, you know, producers to adopt practices that, that uh, mitigate some of the um, effect, effects uh, release of releasing carbon, that sort of thing. And then persistence, you know, how do we keep, how do we keep them um, in, employed uh, and continue to, um, to reap those benefits? Um, the rural economy, the secretary identified the rural economy as a major challenge. And, and, you know, there's two aspects to that. And this is something I really had to emphasize in, in NIFA since I've been there. They often think of rural economy as increasing agricultural productivity uh, and, and, you know, extracting uh, benefits and bet profits from that. And it, yes, that's part of it. And one of the things that the secretary uh, emphasized was, you know, you know, uh, you know trade, uh, agriculture exports uh, is a, one of the major export earners for, for the U.S. Um, and so expanding those opportunities is clearly important. And then all the challenges surrounding um, trade agreements and, and, you know, the evolving nature of, of those. So that, that's an important issue. But the other aspect of the rural economy is the non-agricultural rural economy. Um, and that is, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, very, um, um, you know, it's a major challenge um, in developing, you know, strategies for increasing economic opportunity in rural areas. Uh, so that's an important um, aspect. And then um, soil health, which has gotten a fair amount of attention. We actually have a new program within the um, AFRI foundational uh, program that's specifically focused on soil health. So, um, you know, so, but what are the um, we can economic aspects of that, you know, probably evolving around uh, technology adoption and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but then, and then lastly, um, the, the secretary identified racial justice and equity. And there he's concerned about both uh, sort of internally within the USDA, you know, the challenges that are faced there. So that was, those are internal um, challenges to the, de to the department, but the other aspect of it is those these you know considering um, uh, racial justice and equity throughout all the research programs that we undertake. Um, actually, Spiro uh, Stefano made a really good um, uh, comment the other day um, that you know when 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 we focus on soy and coy, uh, soybean and uh, corn production that sort of thing, we're not talking about small. Uh, you know, black farmers in the rural South, by and large, we're, we're focusing on the white community. And just the choice of the topic that we pursue has implications, um, has that implications for sort of the equity in the research we do. And so, you know, that's, that's a different way of framing uh, the research and the topics and, and how we pursue things. Um, and then, and then there's, you know, um, you know, fundamental, I think, to economic, to you know, a challenge to economics is this trade-off between efficiency and, and equity. Um, they don't necessarily work well together, um, and we don't fully understand how to, uh, uh, how to deal with that. But, but I think it is critical and imperative that we do think about that and think about that in the context of, of uh, all the other research uh, topic areas that we pursue. So those, those are, you know, broad brush, um, what I think some of the big um, areas that we, um, that, that we are interested in supporting at NIFA, and I think, and broadly uh, uh, throughout um, many of the, the competitive funding programs. Um, so the next, I wanted to talk briefly about the Agriculture Economics and Rural Communities Program. This is a program that, that I've been uh, running for, I guess, about the 10 years, past 10 years or so. And I, I don't want to uh, spend a whole lot of time on it, but I just briefly highlight these. And I also, I also want to say, um, you know, if you have questions about these programs, um, anything, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to talk to the people about this stuff. But within the, um, the Ag Econ Rural Communities Program, there's five competitive, five program areas. Um, there's a small and medium-sized farm program. Um, this one addresses the you know, challenges of small farmers looking at scale appropriate technologies and business strategies and opportunities uh, for, for those. 
that's an integrated data invite integrated project, which means there's include research and extension or uh, or education. Um, the economic markets and trade is sort of the broad brush applied micro uh, program. And it deals with everything from market structure and performance and international trade, uh, production, resource use, ag policy, um, farm labor, consumer behavior, um, technology development, science policy, you know, everything um, kind of under, you know, the, the, <laughs> the broad ag applied um, economics. That's a research only um, projects. Um, and then there's the Environment and Natural Resource Economics Program. That was uh, excluded in the um, 2021 um, uh, RFA, and I am forcing it into the 2022. We've actually embodied it in, or embedded it within the economic markets and trade for this past round. Um, and so it, 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 it exists in spirit, um, um, and uh, it will it will be an existing program uh, for for next year. I I I insist. <laughs> um, and 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 again, Madhu was a pa panel manager for that for several years, um, and I really appreciate the work and effort Madhu has put in to make that really rigorous uh, program. Uh, finding good reviewers is just absolutely essential to making these programs uh, work, and it really made a difference. Um, so that will be uh, available next year. Also, the Rural Economics Development Program, and this is one that, that Don uh, has been a panel manager for uh, as well. And I'm extremely grateful for Don and all her assistance to make that a really rigorous uh, program. Um, that is uh, one that's integrated as well. Uh, well, it invites integrated and research only. Um, and that was grown substantially um, over time because it's, it's a, you know, some really exciting work going on in that area. Uh, and then the fifth program, uh, Social Implications for uh, Emerging Technologies uh, is a research program. And, and this one, um, I, I came up with this one, I think it was in 2018 was the first year. And, and uh, the idea behind this was looking at uh, gene editing, gene drives, and those kind of technologies. And, and, and trying to understand what are the broader implications of those to, uh, in society that, you know, they really touch on some really um, um, uh, challenging ethical and, and, and moral issues for that matter. So we, so I wanted to create a program that invited not just economists, but uh, the whole range of social scientists and journalists and legal scholars and the like to, um, to really examine these issues and, um, um, and, and shed some light on, on that. Uh, on those issues, which is, I think, I think it, these, are, these are critical for understanding, um, you know, how to engage the public in, in um, learning to trust science. <laughs> so that's, that was a part of the uh, spirit behind that. Um, there's some other related uh, programs um, within the AFRI RFA. Um, I wanted to mention is one, data science for food uh, systems, um, which is, um, a program designed to uh, utilize data science um, um, and, and you know, machine learning and, and you know, various uh, techniques to uh, look at systems, both at the farm level, system level, um, and in a variety of ways. Um, I think it's an exciting area. Um, what else did I want to mention? Oh, that, well, so um, uh, Dawn uh, sort of, um, when she described the, you know, these networks that, that she was, um, talking about in the last couple slides, um, I th it, that's particularly relevant for the um, Sustainable Ag Systems Program. Um, this is the um, $10 million award program that we've, uh, NIF has been running for about three years now. Um, and there's some really exciting stuff going on there. I won't go into a lot of detail about what, what some of the particular goals are, but they're, you know, they're, they're dealing with climate change and, and food systems and, and the whole variety of issues. But what's, what's, um, what's unique about them is they are, um, they are very interdisciplinary. Um, in fact, I asked for them to be transdisciplinary, which 
you know, I, I view that as uh, the result of uh, interdisciplinary work actually working and creating a new, a new kind of science. Um, they're by definition integrated programs and they, so there must be uh, research education and uh, extension components. Um, and they're to solve a problem, um, to, you know, to, you know, take on a whole variety of disciplines, uh, uh, carve out a very large and important problem and, and solve it. Um, so that's, that's a tall order. Um, but as, as the Don pointed out, economists really are in a, in a position to lead these programs uh, because of, you know, the economists have this systems thinking um, sort of um, in, embedded in the way we view the world. Um, and there are a few uh, economists led uh, SAS projects out there and hopefully there'll be more. Um, so I think it's, it's something uh, uh, to look into. I mean, it is, it's a major uh, undertaking on uh, $10 million is, you know, you know, it's a nice bank account. So um, it, it's pretty serious work and, and worth looking at. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, oh, I, um, the, so the, the foundational programs, the ones I was describing a minute ago, they're now set at $650,000 max, um, up from $500,000 um, previously. And in some of the programs, the economic markets and trade is one. Um, if you have a partner from a um, MSI, a minority serving institution or an international organization, um, you can get an additional 150,000 to support that institution in the partnership. Um, and so that's, that's really in a way to try and develop these relationships, um, you know, put, put our you know, money where our mouth is on that. Um, what else did I want to say about that? Um, I guess that's about it. The, the, um, the other thing I wanted to point out is, you know, we, we have preference for new investigators. Um, you indicate when you submit your application that you're a, a new investigator. And that is someone who's been, um, uh, you're within five years of receiving your PhD and have not had a, uh, not been a PI on a federal grant from any source before. Um, that's the basic eligibility. Um, so that's, that's something to look at, um, and we, we really encourage that. Um, the last couple of things I want to say is really about sort of the grantsmanship tips. Um, uh, it, and again, I want to thank Don for really um, hitting on a number of these points, um, but they're really important and worth uh, uh, repeating. Um, so, you know, the, the, the writing really matters. Um, you, you want this, the, the, I mean, the, you know, you want your mom to be able to understand it. I, I mean, it's that kind of clarity. Um, it really matters. Every single, I, I would venture to say every single um, um, review in the, in the panel process, uh, the first comment that's always said is about the quality of the writing. You know, and, you know, they say this is a well-written proposal. Um, that really stands out. It make first of all, it makes the, it, it easier for the reviewer, uh, which you want to do. You want to make it easy for them to understand what you're trying to do and why it's important. Um, so that's the other thing. You want to have a very compelling um, topic, um, one that that uh, will have impact. You want to be able to make that case that that it will have impact. Uh, and, uh, you know, I say economics is about uh, uh, publicly funded economic research is about public, uh, you know, it's enhancing public uh, policy and public welfare. Um, so pol the policy relevance of the topic, I think, is, is important. Um, you, you want to also sort of uh, be able to indicate that um, there's a high probability of success in, in, um, in, in uh, pursuing your Topic and as actually I think it, David meant, mentioned this um, um, yesterday. You know he he submits proposals on topics for which he's got a fair amount of work already done, um, so he knows he, he knows where this is headed. He knows how it's going to turn out. At least has a good sense of that. And I think that I think that actually is a good strategy. And we see that in in the proposals that it's really well thought out. It's un understood how to pursue it and and what what new things can be learned by uh, pursuing it. Um, 
submit early. As uh, again, Dawn said, just, I just I, I can't be emphasized enough. Um, you know, when should you, when should you submit on the deadline? No, a week before the deadline. Let your grants contracts office know it's coming, um, and so they can prepare to get this out. Um, we only um, uh, uh, will grant an exception if there's a natural disaster, and this has happened where uh, you know, there was a hurricane and you know, um, some universities were shut down, or grants.gov, which is the receiving um, entity uh, for the uh, uh, submissions, if that is down for some reason or other. There's really no other um, um, exemption for that. So, and, and I unfortunately had to uh, turn away um, a couple of proposals this past round, uh, which is really un unfortunate. Um, um, so impact, 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 impact. Um, you know, you know, you want to be able to, you know, think about what what will be different. What will be different when this work is done? Um, how is the world better off as a result? I think, I mean, I, it may sound silly, but I think those are really kind of important questions. Did the taxpayers get their money's worth? Um, you need to be able to make that case. And then so in our, in our, uh, in the reporting that you provide into um, our new reporting system, um, which I can't remember what it's called now. Um, I think it's called the new reporting system. Um, you, you you want you, you know you're asked to provide um, you know, an accomplishment statement. You know you know what's what's the outcome. And typically people say that well you know they were you know they said at one point we're going to uh, create a database and now we've got that database and you know sort of report the progress of uh, the steps involved in doing the research. But when it comes to writing what the accomplishment is, I want to know what did you find why it's important and, and what impact it will have, what, what impact it will have on policy. What are the policy recommendations that come out of your, your findings? Um, that's, that's what matters. It's, you, know, you, 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 you write these in, in, in articles at the end, you always say, what's the implications of your findings? Well, that's, that's what we wanna know as well. Um, I think that's maybe that's what distinguishes it from some other sort of the biological or physical um, research that's done, but even there, I think they would want to make the case of why it's important and, you know, and from what they found. Um, uh, acknowledge a funder, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we are now actually beginning to implement a process where we'd be much more um, effective in tracking um, the outputs, uh, particularly publications. Um, and to way to do that, we're, um, you know, all this can be done automatically using, you know, DOIs, um, you know, know, knowing what the project ID is, the, you know, the um, um, account number, and org IDs. Um, if you have org IDs that identify yourself, um, all this stuff can be tracked uh, fairly automatically. And when we're beginning to try to develop a system to do that. So um, I would encourage you to, if you don't already, to get an org ID. Uh, so that can uh, facilitate tracking that sort of thing. Uh, we really want to be able to say not only just the number of publications, but the quality of them, and and uh, and then get at you know some of the impacts from uh, what you've written. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is, and again, this is a point that uh, Don made, and it's absolutely true. Serving on a panel is the best way to see what the process looks like and what good proposals look like and what not so good proposals look like. Um, and also, you know, hearing the exchange among reviewers about the quality attributes of proposals is incredibly enlightening. Um, and it's really helped um, enhance um, people's ability to be successful uh, in subsequent years. I've seen it time and time again, where they served on a panel and then been successful subsequent to that. I, I, I agree with Don probably later, um, you know, not, maybe not your first, you know, year or two, but uh, later on. But it, it is absolutely um, um, a, a incredibly valuable um, experience. We're in the process of seeking uh, individuals right now for the economic markets and trade and environment and natural resource uh, economics program. Um, so if you're, you feel like you're in a position and you'd uh, like to do that, please send me 
a note in your CV and I will pass that on to the panel manager for that um, and we will you know, you know, see what's possible. Um, that's a good thing. And the last thing I, I wanna say um, is that um, I'm, I'm hoping to leave this job uh, eventually, but I'm, I'm really working to tr leave it in the best shape possible and, and to maintain the quality of the, of the research we fund. And, and part of that uh, does depend on panel managers that we have to, to run these programs. The panel manager uh, um, identifies the appropriate re reviewers and seeks those um, assigns uh, proposals to reviewers, and then essentially runs the panel itself uh, to make sure it's a fair and equitable process. Um, so I, you know, I'm I'm uh, really open, particularly for for you know, some more senior people. Um, to uh, anybody's interested in serving on a panel um, or serving as a panel manager um, in future years, please let me know. Um, you know, you know or if you have any questions about that, I'm glad to. Glad to uh, ask those. And then, and then, so then, then lastly, I really do want to thank Don and Madhu for serving as panel managers. They've been absolutely um, excellent uh, and have really, really strengthened these programs. And I appreciate that. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Um, all right. So a lot has been said, and I think. Um, There's, uh, you know, there's just been a lot of wisdom here. Um, I'm just going to try to fill in a few things um, and maybe repeat a few things in the process, but uh, I'm not gonna try to share my slides because um, we have a lot of stuff that has um, been said and so on. So let me just try to fill in a few additional, make a few additional points. Firstly, so what you heard was a lot of the experience in applying to uh, USDA and NIFA. And uh, in addition to NIFA, you know, uh, there is a variety of other sources available that are worth exploring. So, you know, among the federal grants, NIFA and, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so among the federal, sorry, I should have stayed here. Um, and NIFA has been really one of, the, one of our best friends as, as ag economists in terms of the programs and having programs that, that are designed, you know, that are meant for economists to be lead um, submitters on, but there are, uh, there EPA and hopefully that program will come back, you know, used to have an EPA star program that was meant for environmental economists and I've been fortunate to get funding from them years ago. Um, NSF has got, uh, programs and, and social and behavioral sciences program. And they occasionally come up with, they partner with NIFA or with EPA to make more offerings available. So, you know, so you can look out for that. Uh, and then there are foundations, you know, the um, that get, that offer funding. There are, uh, you know, often state and other local sources, uh, ERS as cooperative grants that, that are uh, sometimes available. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to really cast your net wide, wide um, and look out for what's, what's applicable for your particular area. Um, just in terms of, you know, the types of research topics, just very broadly. So with any of these, funding sources, you know, obviously funding is constrained. And, um, and so what, uh, um, what you what they're, what you're looking for is to come up with topics that have either regional, national or global significance, something that's really a major problem that needs to be addressed. Um, and not only is that a big problem to be addressed, but there is some real scientific and intellectual merit that, that is needed in order to address it. And so, um, you know, what is the most cutting, where is the science in your field? What is the frontier of knowledge in your particular area? And, and what is the gap that you would be filling in with this? So, with, for example, with NSF, it's basically the reviewers are asked to comment, I mean, in two categories, you know, what is the intellectual merit? And then what is the relevance? And so the broad relevance or the broader impacts. And, and so identifying what is that scientific and intellectual merit, which is gonna be the contribution to your field or the interdisciplinary area, I think is really critical. Um, and then the third thing is that it, this knowledge in, has to be generalizable. So if somebody is you know, giving half a million or $650,000, um, it has got to be something that, can, that is transferable, that, that you know, somebody can take from this thing 
that you've applied it to and, and look at it broadly in, uh, in a related context. So if it is very narrowly defined as a case study for a particular problem in a local, you know, affecting one species in one area, that's just harder for reviewers to sort of get behind and, and being willing to fund. Whereas if it's something which, you know, it's, you show it in one area, but it can be applied to other areas, and that's greater likelihood of funding. Uh, and then it has to be relevant to the funding source. And so uh, depending on what is the mission of the funding source agency, um, you know, you have to be able to show how it's meeting the priorities of that agency. Uh, and then lastly, it has to be in your area of expertise. So, you know, that's been said many times that do something that you are passionate and interested in doing. And, uh, and that the way to demonstrate that is through your prior work. So if you have a history of work that you can point back to and say, you know, I've got all these papers showing that I know what I'm doing, then our reviewers have much more confidence that you will be able to carry it out. So, um, you know, in a, to be able to get to, when you apply for funding, to be able to make it into that category of high priority for funding, uh, because that's how the projects, the proposals that are given are laid out. You know, what is high priority, what is medium priority, what is outstanding, and then high and medium and, um, you know, good, and then not to fund. And so you have to really make it into that top category. Um, what is uh, what what really helps to propel a prop proposal there is you know the likelihood of success if this proposal is funded what is the likelihood of success that it's going to happen of course all research is uncertain and risky and as much from the funding agency's perspective and so how can you lower the risk for them and one way to do that is by demonstrating that you have prior work that you know you know exactly what you're going to be doing um, and that you have access to the data that you would be using you know the methods and and you have shown that you have either developed the methods or you you um, can under, you know you can implement them um, and that the project is going to be feasible, that you will be able to carry it out in the time that you have laid out. It's not over ambitious, it's not under ambitious, um, and that the resources that you're asking for are rightly mapped to the work that you're proposing to do and, and so on. Um, the other thing is that you've developed a cohesive team. Um, so, you know, very now there's hardly any proposal that's submitted as a single authored proposal, single investigator proposal. And, and so these are always going to be teams and, um, and you want to have a very carefully choose your team um, to have just the right expertise. You know, you don't want redundancy and you don't want missing expertise. And so, and every person has to have a very clearly defined role that is complementary in that process. Um, and the more you can actually show that this is not a team that came together three weeks before the proposal to write this for the first time, but that this is a team that has been working with each other. If you have a co-authored paper with your team members, that really helps because that shows you have a history of working and you're not going to spend time, you know, learning the language and, and, and so on. Um, and as uh, Don and, and um, Robin both mentioned, it has to be a very well-crafted proposal. The art of writing a proposal is in itself an art, you know, it's, it's just like a paper, but it's even more than a paper because you have to, you know, you're not doing the whole work. You're, you have to explain what you're going to be doing and yet provide enough confidence that, you know, you know what you're doing. Um, you have to be clear about the metrics of success that's been mentioned, the outcomes that are going to come out of this proposal, so somebody can really put their hand on it. And that's sometimes harder for, um, for economists. I mean, I find that with the natural scientists, you know, it's easy for them to make claims about, oh, this is going to increase yields by 30% or, you know, things like that. Or, uh, and whereas for us, you know, we can't really say, well, this is going to increase social welfare by this amount or incomes by that amount. So it's a little bit harder, but you have to still be able to explain what are going to be the outcomes of this. Um, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about, should you be the PI, should you be a co-PI? And, um, and, you know, what I didn't actually should have mentioned in the beginning itself is that, as I sort of mentioned in my talk, the amount, the pot of money that's available for proposals that are led by economists is a very small fraction of the amount of money that's available to the other scientists, that are other sciences. And, uh, and so the likelihood of success is, 10 times more for them than it is for, for us. Um, and the amount of money that they are able to get, I mean, in our profession, it's like 650,000 is a, is a big deal. Um, but, in the, uh, but in the other uh, sciences, 
650,000 is just considered nothing. I mean, you, they are not looking at anything less than a million dollars and it's in multi-million dollars. And they're able to raise multi-million dollars with the same 15 pages that we are able to raise 650,000 with. So you're gonna put in the same amount of effort, 15 pages is what the narrative is gonna be. And if you can get two and a half million as opposed to 650,000, then uh, you know where should you be spending your time? So. Um, so of course the the thing though is that that you know it's, these are I mean it, they're not completely substitutable and and you have to be very careful when you're putting yourself into those large proposals, but um, it's sort of worth thinking about whether when it makes sense to join another team, uh, and when it makes sense to lead your own proposal and and you know it's sort of an individual decision that has to be made depending on what you're doing and so on. So there is no one right path, and don't want to suggest do one or the other. Or, you know, but it's worth considering. Um, and if you are, um, you know, uh, looking at submitting a, a proposal with a, a team of other researchers as a co-PI, um, the a few things that you want to be sort of uh, careful about, um, you know, you have to look at uh, proposals um, that really value you, uh, you as an economist. They may not understand everything that you do. In fact, very few people outside economics really understand what we do. So it's a big education process. I mean, most people think we can put dollars behind things. And that's not because they under, you know, they, it's not because they're trying to, um, you know, uh, denigrate us, but they really do not understand what it is we do. And so it's really our job to try to explain uh, what it is that that we do, but nevertheless. So, um, but you know, if if they value what you're doing and include you from the beginning, and you have a part in the writing of the proposal and in crafting, not writing, but the crafting of the conceptual, you know, goals of the proposal and what's going to be done, and and there is a very clear role for you. I mean, the 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 thing to to do when you're in these interdisciplinary groups is to figure out, you know, does the person who's leading the proposal demonstrate the vision about this thing where you can see a, a place for yourself. You know, uh, what is the vision for this proposal? Do you see a role for yourself that is meaningful and interesting to you and where you think that something interesting will come out of it that will be an advance in your own field in addition to advancing the interdisciplinary knowledge? You know, could you get an AJA paper out of this? Is there some component of this that you can, you know, and all proposals have that room for it. You know, you can, every proposal can allow you to have a portfolio of publications. You can get some AJA and, you know, genes and all of that, and you can get some papers and in interdis good interdisciplinary journals. So make sure that you can see that, you know, a little bit. I mean, of course, it's always hard to kind of, look too far ahead, things are very rather fuzzy at the beginning and all of that, but you know, try to, that's sort of one of the things that I think can help. Um, and also the other thing to see is, you know, when does, the, in that interdisciplinary proposal, when is economics gonna actually start to play a role? In, you know, if it's a five-year proposal, the first couple of years may be just spent by people doing the field work to, to get the data. And there's, you know, you really can't do anything until they have done their work. So there's a sort of a sequential timing aspect of this that you have to look out for. And does that timing fit in with what you're doing? If you're, you know, if you're coming up for tenure and you, you need some, you know, wins in the next year, is this proposal going to get you there? Or is this something that has really, a, it's a long game and, and you have to, you know, be looking at, if you need an immediate win, you might need to focus your efforts on something else. So there's that aspect as well that, that you have to uh, look out for. Um, yeah, so I, so um, anyway, so I think those are just some some thoughts and let me sort of stop here. Uh, we are actually we've taken up the whole hour uh, on this, but we do have some room in our, our schedule today. So let's just open it up to questions for um, on this particular topic and then we'll take a you know break and come back and do the small group sessions. so. So if you have a question, uh, just come up and ask over here and, and John or, or Robin will also try to address it. And that applies to our Zoom members as well. So just feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, ask a question. Yes. No, 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 please come up here. Come on, we're gonna make you walk. Gotta get those steps in.
so my question is uh, mainly directed towards Robin that I was saying you need this whole body of work in order to demonstrate, you know, probability of success. And how do you demonstrate that maybe when you're uh, still junior faculty and uh, when that body of work is still developing? Uh, yeah, that is a challenge because I mean, the the, um, the the direct evidence is you know in the in the uh, um, um, proposal in the package you know there's the the CVs of the uh, PIs and co-PIs and um, their current and pending pending funding uh, so you can actually see you know pretty good evidence of the of the track record. Um, so I guess you know I mean it's, you're still um, um, need to um, try and try and have as much of a track record as you can to demonstrate uh, your knowledge in a particular area. Um, I mean, I'm not sure um, how else you would do that, frankly. So, <laughs> uh, but I, but you know, so trying to get a part, uh, be a part of a team where you can uh, provide, um, you know, get some experience would be, I think, probably the best uh, investment. Yeah, that's what I want to also to, uh, see if I'm being a faculty member, join a group with the senior faculty members so that you can show your expertise, maybe on a particular area, you are coming in for the particular aspect of the project. So you may not have, you may not have a long track record, but as a team, you may be able to contribute to the proposal. And I guess just to that point, you know, um, it really helps initially to work with senior faculty to write that proposal because they do have the credentials and, um, you know, but they also need to have new ideas and methods and things in their team. So, um, so, so you learn in that process. And I mean, even for people who are, um, you know, postdocs, and I know some here, many of you are here. And I would say, uh, even if that is not exactly part of your job description, if there is an opportunity, because mo I'm sure the PI that you're working with is going to be looking for funding and volunteer and offer and step up to help to uh, write uh, and, and, you know, contribute to a proposal. So tell them that you would like to contribute if they're writing a proposal and, uh, you know, learn from that process uh, because, and in fact, I mean, I've had that case where, where you know, uh, somebody was with a postdoc with me, helped me with a proposal and then uh, got a faculty position and, and you know, uh, I put his name as a as a co-PI on the proposal. And so that really helped him to get a faculty job because now he could say, you know, I've already got a demonstrated um, record of being able to help with a proposal and get funding. And so, uh, you know, and that's a great way to get an ex get experience in writing it. The conversation has been around a lot you know, look at our as they're coming out and then actively go search them out. And when I was hearing from Robin was, it's, it's more that you should try to find teams that are already developing our piece rather than you trying to initiate all of the GoPI work of developing the team, putting it together, but then realizing that if you are the PI, you find the RFP that fits your program and then you know, you're trying to put that team together, you're really taking the PI role on that, but that you're going to be evaluated based upon your body of work, which is really insufficient to potentially be funded as a PI. And it's kind of, I understand what you're saying, is be part of a team, be a co-PI, and kind of have senior faculty members kind of help you with that. Really entails that they're developing the RFP or the, the proposal, and then they're trying to find people I think it's, yeah. So is your, is the point that, that, you know, um, how do you join a, a team of people that might be, um, yeah, I mean, the way that's where I think firstly, uh, you know, the, it comes down to a little bit of networking and that you are communicating a word around of what you are doing, what you're interested in, 
in your own department or institution as well as meetings like this. So if uh, you know somebody is working on a particular topic and they need that expertise, they will have your name in mind and reach out to you. So that's essentially, um, you know, or if you uh, hear that somebody is working on this, you know, very often that's hard to do because, you know, that's not public knowledge. And so it's hard to, you know, you, so part of it is just hoping that you will get that invitation, but the way to have that is by, um, you know, uh, spreading the word around of what you're working on. Um, and hoping people find you. So the more, again, making your not making your, you know, putting out your CV and putting out, you know, doing press briefs for whatever you're doing, things like that. Anything that clicks in somebody's mind when they're looking for a name and your name pops up is really, it's a bit of a random thing, but I think that's fun. <laughs> and I did want to mention again that, you know, we, we, um, we have um, new investigator grants and I think uh, NSF has something similar. Uh, and it's, it's really, um, you know, it's, we, we really encourage these things. We try and we give them some preference. Um, and uh, so we try to, you know, look, look for those opportunities. And, and often what will happen was, is the new investigator will be the PI. Um, and you can have a senior faculty member as a co-PI. And that's, that's, that's very often the case. Um, and so the, the, those proposals are evaluated just the same as every other proposal is. So it's got to have, have the, the, the intellectual merit. Um, uh, but you can, you can create a team um, that is supportive uh, in this effort. And, and, and so that, you know, you could be the PI in that case. So that's not an opportunity. The, the other thing that hasn't been mentioned yet, because some of us are from smaller or mid-sized programs that aren't don't have the depth of teams is this is a great way to reach into your multi-state regional research committees and next time you guys all convene given you know what the RFPs were this year they'll be approximately the same next year except for some of the new new initiatives Robin said is um, you know the one I belong to two of them I belong to food and vegetable marketing and rural development will like actually make part of our agenda brainstorming if there's projects people want to coalesce around and do as multi-institution. I don't think, Robin can correct me, I don't think you get any extra points for being multi-school. But again, for some of you particularly who want to use that as perhaps a way to, to build your network because, or you're in a smaller program, you just don't have the right team to assemble where you are. That's also, I think, a strategy that would be well-received. So Robin I mentioned, the sustainable agriculture system program. So, and uh, I just want to, I serve as the panel manager for a couple of years of that program. So I just want to say that you should please read the RFA carefully, you know, before you submit a proposal. I, you know, what, you know, when you miss the key component, for example, this SAS program requires both research, extension, teaching, and education. So many, some of the proposals miss the education part and, and, and the reviewer could you know, easily catch that. I mean, they, 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 they would, they'll catch that for sure because in a way, generally they try to recruit a very balanced panel, you know, some, some panel, panelists focus on research, some folks on education, some folks on extension. So if you miss one of the components and the, the, the panelists will catch that. Then that would that that tend that generally we think you propose best if you miss uh, you know a key components uh, in the proposal. So that's something I just uh, want to punch punch it out. Just make sure you you follow the guideline and don't miss any major component because those are large uh, uh, project you know ten million dollar project and uh, you know they you know. They receive a lot of proposed, excellent, good proposal. You know, the, the panelists always find something, try to find something that, that to, uh, you know, to bring some proposals down, I guess. <laughs> so if you miss a, a component, key components, generally you're not going to fare well in the process. Yeah. And that uh, applies to any RFP that you are looking at. I mean, I can't emphasize how important it is to read the RFP multiple times to, because it provides very clear guidance, which we in a rush never 
pay enough attention to. But actually the RFP provides very clear guidance in terms of what all need to be the components of that proposal. I mean, it's, and, uh, and you know, it's sort of just um, stepping away from your, pro your 15 page and your ideas, just making sure that you hit upon each one of those things um, you know, and that whole, that's an art in and of itself that uh, comes with, um, you know, uh, firstly, working with people who are more familiar and adept at writing these proposals. And really for large proposals, you know, for these multi-million dollar uh, types of proposals, you have a proposal support staff in your institutions that help with that, whose job it is not to know anything about the content of what you're writing, but to make sure that you're hitting upon each one of those things and to be able to point out, you know, you didn't mention how this is addressing the priorities or you're weak on, you know, it requires research education and extension or you haven't, you know, you need to stress, uh, strengthen this component. So. Um, you know, and part of in uh, the art of writing good proposals, which is again one of the hard things to do because we're all so busy and stretched, is to really take enough time to write it. It even though it looks like oh, it's just fifteen pages, you know, I can turn it out in two weeks. Um, it's actually much harder, and and it's better if you give yourself three months to write it, so that you can come back and read it and and make sure that it's completely polished. And and as Robin said, you know, it's got to be a well written proposal. It really requires a lot of investment of time in just the writing and the presentation and getting the clarity to come out of it. So. Um, you know, and that's why very often, uh, you know, and, and uh, is it, you know, when you do it the second time or the third time, uh, your proposal fares better. Not only have you had time to read it after a year, you go back and then you yourself realize what was missing, but also in the process over that one year, if you continue to do that research. So if you get something that is rejected, don't just give up on it and discard it. Uh, use that to a good outcome that I've seen from proposals because all the work that you've done in it, it, write a review paper based on the literature review that you did for the proposal and publish it in AEPP. And then next year when you submit with the team members, you know, you've got a paper that you can cite and now you can say, you know, this publication shows that I know what the literature and what I'm talking about. And the next year proposal will be even better. And so, you know. And who I just wanted to comment on that um, because I think, um, that part of doing a really good literature review and really being able to place your idea in the context of what's going on in the field is very important to showing intellectual merit. So if you have any sense in your proposal that you don't know what's going on in the literature or you, you're, you're not up to date, um, that's going to really hurt the quality. That's really going to hurt the evaluation of the proposal. And that literature review is something that um, you can be working on um, even, you know, well before the actual proposal that you're going to use all that background in. But being uh, very uh, uh, thinking very clearly about where you're going to fit in the literature is is key, I think. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. It, well, and, that, and that comes out in the review process, because I mean, that, that's, that, I mean, it's a, it, that happens a lot where the, where don't they realize <laughs> this has been done or something like that. So uh, those panels are very good, uh, very thorough. Um, I, I also want to make a comment about, uh, Judge, you made about the education component. Uh, funding a graduate student is not um, uh, an education function. <laughs> Actually, develop a, a curriculum is 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 what the, the education function is about. So just a note on that. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions? Yes. So most of the discussion has been about sort of bigger grants, but I'm curious if in any of the panel had any thoughts on um, pursuing seed grants that would eventually, sometimes they're internal. I know NIFA has some seed grants, but any advice on when to pursue those and any strategies with those? Uh, yeah. Robin, so I was gonna just turn to you. If you wanna talk about the exploratory grants that you offer, 
uh, gosh, you know, I don't think we offer them anymore. <laughs> oh, you Maybe did, I'll, right? The smaller yeah. ones, the $150,000. Yeah, ones. they were smaller. And the idea was that, yeah, they're, and I, I, no, I don't think we offer them anymore, but we do, we do have seed grants and, um, you know, they're, you, you, it's sort of a proof of concept grant and you want to sort of make the case that you've got a good idea you need to develop, you need the data to develop it. And you may have some preliminary data um, that you, you want to, you know, develop further. Um, so we, we encourage those. They, they fall under the, um, what we call phase grants, which are um, for strengthening um, grants. So, so eligible universities, um, minority serving 1890 are available uh, for those, uh, so. Yeah, but in addition to uh, NIFA, you know, every, I'm sure, uh, land grant university uh, has opportunities to, has uh, pots of money to provide seed grants, $30,000, you know, enough to fund for one year. It funds a graduate student uh, and, uh, or two, and it, you can bring a you know, team together and start to put a proposal together. And that helps to prepare. I mean, that's becoming more and more common. I know at our university, there's a lot of these seed grants available from multiple sources that can together you get a couple of these and you can have $100,000 and really kind of launch off your research program. So um, look out for all possible funding sources and just uh, be opportunistic about it. And, and um, uh, yeah, it's sort of one step at a time. But having done that, that really helps strengthen a subsequent proposal because then there's more evidence that, you know, the idea actually can bear fruit. Yeah. I have a, a question for uh, folks in the departments. Um, what's the status these days of uh, using cooperative agreements or writing a cooperative agreements or hatch funding? Is that a thing anymore? Because that's a good source of sort of, of seed type money often, or it used to be. In universities? Yes. Um, well, I, you know, I don't have, I mean, you know, we don't really have too many, uh, too much of that. We have some uh, seed funding programs on our campus where you can apply and then occasionally you might be able to um, you know, talk with people at ERS and if they have a pot of money, get a cooperative agreement with them. I know that, um, you know, I mean, you know, David's not here, but I know David's been very, was very successful in getting cooperative funding from EPA, for example, but those were the days when they, that was probably available, which is now not so easy. So, um, so maybe other people know more about that. Yeah. Actually, really, really timely, J Julie, because, um, we, we it probably just wrapped up this round, but you know, if you look at what Economic Research Service, for, for instance, has been through the last two years, and Spiro's doing a great job of rebuilding, they're they're hiring like crazy, but they lost, if you think about it, a lot of their content ex, context experts. So they're hiring probably more from general econ programs than ever. And they're loving the skills that they're seeing. But for instance, where they approached us on a cooperative agreement, they know they have hired a great toolbox and skill set, but they need some people to kind of round out the team who have um, worked in particular topics that they covered at ERS, which is pretty much everything now. So again, about every year about this summertime, because their years run September 30th, to October 1st, they, they will start kind of tapping around for ideas, usually internally with a team member at ERS. But again, those are some of those folks are so new, they might not even know. But I think this actually is a really good time as they continue to rebuild to approach them because I think he still has his full budget, but he only has so many people to pay. So I think you would probably need to ask around in your department or your networks or even here for people who know people within ERS or perhaps some of you already do or someone you went to school with went there. But I think cooperative agreements actually might be pretty fruitful for a while because so many agencies were so badly hit by um, losing so many employees so fast. And, and they want to, as you can tell, ERS is just doing a fantastic job of rebuilding and making sure they're putting reports out at the pace they used to. So um, I, I did have luck when I, I did not have any luck with grants pre-tenure. That was my one thing on my tenure packet I got a hit for. 
Janet Perry was the Committee on Women in Ag Econ chair at the time I was vice chair. I noted that to her. She got a cooperative agreement with me with ERS and that that was actually a really good seed for me to start feeling like I did learn some, some um, skills about how, how you think differently as an academic when you're trying to make a, a funder and grantor happy versus a journal editor. So if you do have any networks or connections that, that EPA, um, ERS gives them, Ag Marketing Service gives them, Risk Management Association gives them, um, um, food, I, think, I think the Nutrition Service gives them occasionally, um, rural development. So there are places that particularly if they lost a lot of employees and they're still trying to get reports out the door, they are interested. And um, so maybe even ask around your department or your network about people who have relationships. This year, you're a little late because again, the way the feds work, those will probably all have been decided. But you know, about, about May next year, that's when they start kind of throwing out ideas of like, who has ideas for things that could be funded? That's a really good idea. So Julie, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll add it. I used to be, I used to manage a lot of cooperative agreements at uh, at ERS, and you know, had a network of people, and I, you know, solicited or received suggestions for ideas throughout the year, and always kept them in my hip pocket as a as a manager at, at ERS. So when it came to the end of the fiscal year, which is now or actually July, um, you had these available to you, or people, you know, solicited them to you. And, and, and because there's always, you know, you're in money uh, to, to deal with. And, and now I'm sure there's a ton of you're in money uh, at ERS because they, they've got this, I think their budget is around 80 million, 85 million. And, you know, they have, I don't know what, 30, 40% of the staff. So they've got funds available. So <laughs> I, would, I would call people right now, <laughs> but it may be too late. <laughs> So one uh, question that I think had come up earlier, and maybe Robin, since we brought you here, I would, uh, you could help answer that, is you know, to what extent and what strategy should early career uh, people fa uh, follow in getting to know program managers in different agencies? You know, uh, should, is, uh, firstly, how do you uh, reach out to them? In your experience, do they return those calls and what is their attitude towards it? I mean, are they welcoming them or are they, you know, leave me alone kind of thing? <laughs> and, um, and um, you know, should, should they make a trip to DC and go to NSF and NIFA and so on or? Yeah, yeah, and, and the, the good old days going to DC and, and I mean, that's what happened often was um, uh, a lot of, um, you know, you know, a lot of schools would bring a whole cadre of, of early career people around and do the rounds, go to NIH, DOE, you know, NSF and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, that's one of the things lost by moving NIFA out to Kansas City. Although, you know, kind of all virtual now, so it doesn't matter. I always uh, respond to people. To me, that was the best part of the job. That absolutely, I enjoy talking about people's research ideas and then help them uh, think about maybe ways to cast them that might be a little more successful or, or relevant or, or what have you. Uh, so I, I mean, I think um, I think most of the people, the program leaders at, uh, at NIFA are responsive. Um, and so I absolutely encourage you uh, to feel free to reach out. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy to take a call. I'm happy to talk to people about this stuff. And I think that, I think that's by and large a case. I think, I think that's the case with many of the other um, science uh, agencies as well. Um, we also used to do, um, you know, uh, um, do grant writing workshops. Uh, I've been invited often to do that. And I haven't done that. Uh, well, I haven't done any traveling in the past year or so. And I'm not sure what the future is for that, but um, that's the kind of thing uh, that that we do, or I've 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 done them with the association at um, at pre or post conference things. Um, so we, you know, I I don't think there hasn't been as much outreach as there used to be. I hope that ramps up again. But in the meantime, I, I really encourage you to, to uh, reach out to me uh, or any of the other program leaders that are appropriate. Yeah, so I'll speak to that a little bit also. Um, you know, I think they have a database uh, at NIFA, I know, especially where they you, you can put in a profile. And that, you know, all 
I would encourage uh, young faculty to complete that profile and reach out to program leaders and then they know they're in the database and interested in uh, participating. You can kind of do a profile based upon your areas of expertise and when they're looking for somebody or when a panel manager comes in, they search that database and identify because they want people at all levels, at the assistant level, associate in full, and they can identify people pretty quickly that way, so. Yeah. And again, I mean, just from my experience, which I've sort of seen now um, that, you know, economists tend to not do this as much as the other sciences who are much more out there at these agencies beating the drum on the, the important problems in their areas and then in the process for themselves as being the a people able to do that. And, and, I, and I mean, Robin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that is probably also useful from your perspective or as, as NPLs and so on to, you know, when you're designing RFPs, you're, you know, that's the kind of information that is probably useful. So you can feed in and directly into RFPs by sort of giving these ideas. And then when the RFP is out, you know, it fits in your area. So it's a little bit of a long game, but it's certainly something that is, you know, worth being part of. It's, the <laughs> RFPs are not just exogenously given out there, you know, they are being developed through your ideas from the field. That, that, that is exactly right. Um, I, I don't want to give any secrets away, but I, I do. I mean, I, I pay attention to what goes. I try to keep up with the literature as much as possible. I mean, actually, somebody said uh, yesterday about being, well, you know, Twitter is actually helpful. Uh, you'd be surprised um, how useful some of that those insights are. And, and it, does, it does feed back in um, uh, because um, there's nuance in, in the in the research questions, um, and uh, what what I what I I mean I was really surprised when I first started writing these was that people respond to exactly what's in there, and we, I mean we always lead off the um, in the RFA. Here's the topics of interest, but they're not exclusive. Um, so you know it's it's really it's you know essentially like NSF's call where it's just give me good research on, you know, economics. Um, and, you know, in a large part, you know, we're interested in that, but that we have, you know, some areas of interest we have. So people uh, people do respond to those. So I try to make that language as open um, as possible, but also nudge people in certain directions at the same time. So, and, and that's why, you know, uh, uh, listening to your, ideas is really helpful for me and I hope helpful for you at the same time. Right. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, if you, you know, if you want to serve on the panel, so you, you, can, you can always volunteer, you know, you, talk, you contact the national program leaders, so they do pass name to the panel manager. So we do, you know, when I served as a panel manager, so I did get a few names uh, yeah. passed from the national program leader, like Rob and uh, other people. So, you know, we, yeah, I think it's always good to reach out to yeah. the national program leader. Yeah, yeah. Judge, you really had, really got trial by fire with the, with the SAS programs. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just have a quick question, probably related to uh, what you guys already mentioned. Uh, for Robin or for Don, who has you know more experience managing these things, I was wondering if you guys can share some stats on the probability of sex for new investigators. You know, when there are PIs, I would love to know some numbers to have a better idea. Well, well, overall, the uh, success rate in um, all the programs is. I, you know, I, I would say 12 to 15 percent, some higher, um, we, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I, and I think 15 percent is um, pretty good, um, you know, uh, if, if it's much higher than that, we're, we're not getting that, you know, not, we're not getting enough proposals. Um, but for um, new investigators, um, so, so here's the way that works. We, we, we know a proposal is a new investigator. And then when, as we rate, rate all the proposals or rank them all, 
Um, we and you know we go through this process of reviewing and then and then we we get this ranking that the uh, motto mentioned a minute ago there is outstanding, high priority, medium priority, and on down. And they don't they don't get funded if they come with a ranking uh, lower than medium priority. Um, so the 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 the, the the deal is to find the funding line, you know, based on how much fund is available and what's being requested by these proposals. And we want to move the new investigators above the funding line so they uh, can be funded as long as they, you know, uh, uh, get high enough uh, ranking and medium priority or above. And so we 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 kind of slide these around so that works out so they, so that. It actually increases the odds of a of a, a new investor, new investigator getting funded. I can't give you what numbers there would be. I, I can't. I don't. I just don't know what they are offhand. Um, but it's it's uh, not zero. <laughs> it's it's high. It's much higher than that. Um, I think we we fund typically two or three new investigators out of you know just a handful that we may get in a in a given year. Uh, in, in in any program so uh, you know maybe the odds are uh, 30 percent i'll just throw that out there which is high so yeah and it's certainly higher than for other agencies i mean that's what makes nifa so much more attractive for ag economists in particular because yeah. you know you've got a reasonably a good chance and and if you actually take out that you know about 20 percent i'd say of proposals and a typical thing would be in the do not fund for various reasons then you know you're really in the much more yeah 80, you know off the 80 percent you're in the top 30 percent right. that's a lot so all right any other questions Okay, so it's 10 o'clock right now here um you know let's just take a 15 minute break all right so it's magic of technology go from one window to another <laughs> thanks for coming back um all right so we'll uh get me started and um you know just maybe what i'll um you know uh so a few next steps and then what i would really like is perhaps for every all of the mentees who are here to uh take a minute to just uh tell us what was the one thing that they learned that you know one takeaway from this for them that they think will be useful and we'll just go around the room and, and have everybody give us their one thing one wisdom that they got out of this workshop that'll be useful I did. Yeah, I will start. Yeah. So while I'll give you a couple minutes to think about what it is that is um, that you'd like to say. Uh, and and uh, from our side, you know, uh, we hope that this is the start of a relationship with you. Uh, it's obviously too short a period to really go into and, and you know, um, uh, answer all of the questions and give all uh, to share all of the uh, knowledge, whatever that we that the mentors have. So feel free to connect with us uh, after this. You know, not necessarily within the groups that you were or beyond the groups. Um, that you know, um, uh, reach out to to, to any of uh, of us uh, with any uh, questions or you know, tell us how things are going for you or if you want us to give you any feedback on the next versions of your papers, you know, send those to us and, and uh, we'll try our best to be able to respond to you in a timely manner. Um, and tell us about, you know, conferences you're going to and if we are there, we can, you know, have coffee there. So keep in touch and uh, keep in touch with your peers and with us and, you know, I'm sure we will be seeing more of each other uh, going forward. So this is really a first step. All right. So um, let's just start with the people um, sharing one one idea that they got out of this that was useful to them. I'll just go down with our uh, online ones first and, um, you know, in the order in which I'm seeing you. So uh, why don't we start with you, Jayesh? Thank you, Madhu. I learned a great deal about 
uh, how to write successful grants and what are the things that we should be focusing on as junior academics. And I really appreciated everyone's inputs and more importantly, the feedback I got for the presentations. So that's been great. And I hope to stay in touch with everyone and look for, forward to uh, learning more about everyone's research. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Lyndon? Yeah, uh, it's been great to listen to the many uh, wisdoms from our great mentors. And um, I think a big takeaway is to uh, set up your reputation in the field for uh, successfully securing uh, tenure, finding big questions by reading the news, by talking to um, people from extension in the real world to get uh, great ideas and also serve on NEPA panels to get a better idea about uh, grants, grantsmanship. Okay, great. Um, Nicholas? Yes. So first of all, thank you very much for all the help. Uh, the whole uh, event has been really helpful for me. Uh, I like uh, and I feel uh, this sense of uh, uh, I'm doing the right way in terms of uh, trying to acquire these writing skills in terms of uh, grants and uh, all those resources are really valuable uh, and I mean it's really it's really good to know that um, you require practice and it takes time to to actually learn that and I'm, I'm trying to do that way as well um, and the other thing that I that I, uh, I Appreciate this all the feedback uh, about my paper. Uh, it's been great to uh, excellent professionals in the in the small group, and I uh, and I look forward to keeping in contact with everyone and try to uh, uh, to let everybody know uh, how I'm doing and, and try to uh, stay in touch for other matters. Thanks, uh, Shelley. Thank you. Yeah, first out, we definitely want to thank Maru and Junji for the excellent advice I've received over the last two days in the small group, and then just all the mentors together. I have a lot of great notes on all sorts of advice. Um, but I would say for me, as an ag economist that's now in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, I think a big piece of advice that will be helpful for me was Jill's advice on asking someone in the school to write a mock evaluation of my CV with strengths and weaknesses. So I can understand what you know the folks in public affairs are expecting from me because I cannot get a straight answer from anyone. Uh, Zanchen? Hi. Um, first, thanks everyone for having me here. It's really a great honor. Uh, so as I just said, I mean, as I said in the beginning, uh, I still have uh, like. PhD candidate. So this is my uh, academic training 101. So virtually everything will be helpful to me. But I think the most important thing is just what I learned from David and uh, Junjie that you can have fun in this process. Thank you. Um, Li Qing? Yeah, first, of course, just want to thank everyone for the great comments and inputs, like especially the comments I get for my paper. That's a great help. Also, like for the things I learned, I think the things like how to write successful grant, uh, grant proposal and also from Jinjie, like how, what is the important and interesting research question and how to get started to find this type of research question. That's all very helpful for me. I'm really looking forward to stay in touch with everyone and hopefully meet everyone in person someday in other conferences. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, Katie. Um, thank you to the organizers and thank you for putting this on. It was super beneficial. I think my biggest takeaway was the importance of building your network. So thank you. Great. All right, um, let's have our in-person uh, mentees that give us their thoughts. So we'll talk with you. Or we'll just come up, maybe just line up here. Um, <laughs> <that'll> be... <laughs> Uh, first, I would like to thank all the mentors and uh, the valuable comments I received for my uh, upcoming paper. And 
uh, my biggest takeaway is also networking. I met a lot of uh, future collaborators and new friends, and it was great. And thank you. I'll just echo everyone's thanks, especially for especially for the comments and. Um, I think the biggest thing I took away was was about packaging your big ideas that are all in one paper right now into multiple, smaller, more digestible papers. So thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for, for for organizing and for all of the mentors for the, the useful feedback. Um, one of the things that I'm really glad uh, that uh, you all talked about was work-life balance and like, because I feel like that's something as an academic I struggle with a lot. And so it's good to know that I, you know, need to be paying attention and focusing on that. Um, and, and so, yeah, that was super useful among a, a million other things as well. <laughs> Hi, um, yeah, again, I want to thank you for everyone here. And uh, for me, I received really, you know, helpful um, feedback on my papers from my mentors and the other group members in my session. And I guess for me, the biggest takeaway is like, um, because I am working in the industry, I actually didn't expect, you know, to learn so much more from this workshop. And this is my first time to be here. But really from all the conversations I have in the session with, you know, people here, I feel like um, um, I definitely can see a lot of, you know, potential um, collaborations between me and other people. And also my unique like skill sets or the experience can also be useful to other people too. So that's definitely um, the like very, um, 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 yeah, I, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. So yeah, thanks for everybody that participated and all the mentors and comments and stuff. One thing I got um, away from this is that I think the fun part of this job is having tons of projects to manage, but it's also the very scary part of the job and uh, learning about how to manage that and when to say yes to things and what sorts of projects to join was really helpful. Um, I also really enjoyed just the camaraderie. There's something that I didn't get the past year, becoming an assistant professor, it was meeting people. Um, and so, yeah, to all of you guys that were COVID professors the past year and started during the pandemic, I think it was very unique. Um, and so it's really nice to meet and see some of you online. Um, so definitely keep in touch. So. Hi. Um, yeah, so I think I would like to thank you all for putting this together. I think it was uh, extremely informative. I think what I've learned as I'm looking at an academic potential, potentially returning to academia is the linearity of the process that I have to look at as far as I look at the potential career options. And, you know, speaking to David's point about, uh, you know, knowing what I'm good at and where I fit into this world. So not trying to become a unicorn, uh, but doing something that actually fits. Um, and I think I'm in the same boat with Katie a little bit and, you know, trying to build your network in a field that is not aligned with what you've been doing before um, is incredibly important. And I really appreciate the, the environment and the camaraderie here um, that kind of, I think it's a first, good first, I won't say first, but good step towards that direction. So thank you. Well, I think everybody have said it all. I just want to thank you <laughs> for, for, you know, organizing this and putting the effort. I know all of you have families that are waiting for you back home. So staying a couple of additional days here means a lot for all of us. And we had such a great time here. So we really appreciate it. I think I'm the last one. So thank you everyone again. Um, no, the one thing that I, I really got out of it was to provide small snippets of, of impact or recommendations from people who have looked at your work that I can then start to, to bank into as I start to build my portfolio and that I can draw upon. Uh, was really helpful and get that feedback from people so that uh, I can just start building that out. Well, technically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, for, to everyone for 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 first uh, putting this together and then taking the time out to um, plan it, organize it, execute it, and uh, take you know being here um, since I know that you know there's a lot of pressing other things that we all have to to do, especially in in your positions. Um, so I just wanted to say that I definitely learned a lot, and I under I've learned the importance of creating good and solid networks as you um, uh, grow in your in your area. And never feeling too shy or ashamed to just kind of send your work out there because you never know who's going to see it and um 
give you an email or a call or think, oh, this was the greatest thing I, I read and I want to work with you. So um, kind of having the confidence and uh, to, um, to, to know that you, you're in the field and you belong in the field and you have a voice and you, sh you can say something. So thank you all for that. Okay. I'll just stay here. I'm going to go to 